Good evening, everyone. We are going to call the special city commission meeting for Tuesday, March 22nd, 2022 to order. May we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Bradford? She's in the back. Commissioner King? In the back. In the back. Commissioner McCool? In the back. back. Commissioner Ramos? Present. Uh, Commissioner Sosa? In the, in the back. back. Uh, Commissioner, I mean, Vice Mayor of Vila Vasquez? Present. And Mayor Herzberg? I am here. May we all rise for pledge to the flag, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this evening we have one item of business, which is um, Park and Rec. The first item is review of parks and recreation survey. The second is a discussion regarding the general facility and building conditions, request for a approval to award and a contract to ABM, and discussion regarding facility use agreements. Mr. Peters, see here? Stacy, you're it. Mm-hmm. Would you like, shall we take a few minute recess? Uh, he's coming out of the back like everyone else. So I, mean, I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, we had an executive session upstairs, started at five and ran late, so that's why we're all down here late. So, okay, Mr. Peters, back at the mic. You're up, sir. Anytime. Did we do the pledge and leeching? We are done. We're up to okay. you. Okay. Item 4A, review of parks and recreation survey. Okay, we, um, we have our guest this evening from GAR. Uh, she's going to talk about the accreditation process and the results of the survey that we did on parks and recreation. Go ahead. Okay. Yay. Okay, great. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here this evening. Uh, just a little bit about who I am. My name is Kristen Caborn. I'm the Director of Park System Planning at GAI Consultants. GAI is a design firm. Um, we've got about 100 people in the Central Florida area, and I sit in our community solutions group, so you'll see CSG used periodically um, with the red, you can see the red rectangle in the top corner. Um, our community solutions group focuses our work, about 80% of our work is public sector work. We do planning, urban planning, regional planning, landscape architecture, and urban analytics and GIS. So we're very fortunate in that our parks and recreation master plans incorporate all of these disciplines and looking forward to giving you an overview of our process. With me tonight I have Andrea Penuela. She has worked with me on the inventory of all of Deltona Parks. We'll get through that in a little bit. And then also we have our survey partner on Zoom. Kaylin is with us. And when we get on the um, overview of the survey, I'm going to let Kaylin talk you through it because she is the expert. So just really quickly, um, and there's going to be, I'm going to pause through the presentation because this is our first time getting to meet you all and we're really excited about this. So I'm going to pause during the presentation. We're going to give you some information and then three times we're going to stop to get some input back from you. So we've got Kaylin and Andrea to help me with answering questions and making sure that we get your input. But please, by any stretch, if I start talking fast or anything, you have a question, just let me know. But we did build that in. So looking at the purpose of a master plan, um, you all have a plan that is well over 10, 10 years old at this point. So we're going to start with that. We're going to look at what you have set for goals in the past. We're going to also look at the city's comprehensive plan process because all comprehensive plans, of course, have a recreation open space element that established an adopted level of service for parks in Deltona. So we're going to look at that and we're going to refresh it. We're going to modernize it. We're going to look at the types of level of service that make sense for Deltona. And that's not just going to take into consideration some of the old metrics that you might have had, which would be we're going to have 
one acre of park for every thousand residents or things like that. We're gonna take into consideration your population, your demographics, the trends in recreation, um, where your growth is, how old your population is now, how they're going to look 20 years from now. So we can make it be a real living, breathing document that makes sense for Deltona. It isn't a cookie cutter approach to something that's unattainable or doesn't make sense for your specific residents. So we're gonna really look at it as a blueprint for your future. We try to be flexible enough to respond to community needs, but we also want to give commission and the Parks and Recreation Department some direction on where to go over the next few years help have a capital improvement program that makes sense based on what we see in the field and what we hear and what the goals are as we move through the process. And then the ultimate goal is to improve Deltona as a place to live, work, and play, but really the focus on living and, and playing when we, when we talk about Deltona. So one of the really unique things is the CAPRA National Accreditation Process. And this is something that the Parks and Recreation Department has taken on voluntarily. Just wanna give you a little orientation to it. CAPRA stands for the Commission on Accreditation of Parks and Recreation Agencies. It's an accreditation that's administered by the National Recreation and Parks Association. It's very prestigious and it's something that spent, that departments spend a couple of years getting ready to go through that process. The numbers in Florida, um, the last I checked, there's about 25 accredited agencies in Florida. Um, the numbers always hover in the mid-20s for Florida. It can vary because the accreditation process runs um, on different cycles, but that really is quite a prestigious feather in the cap of your Parks and Recreation Department and sets out the fact that your department is looking to meet national standards and the way they deliver programs, the way they provide their parks maintenance, and the Parks and Recreation Master Plan is just a small component of the overall accreditation process. It is important because it is one of the required elements. So tonight I'm just gonna take you through the required elements of the national accreditation standards that relate to the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. So this is specifically what we're going to, the section that we're gonna be taking on with the Parks and Recreation Department as we move through the process. So working with the agency um, on the mission and objectives, those are things that Mr. Reckley and his department are going to be working on and will be giving to us. And as part of this process, we'll think through that with them and use the information that we get through the planning process to help sh make sure that makes sense. We're also doing a leisure and trends analysis. So what we wanna do is make sure that Deltona is balancing the needs of what your residents want now, but also into the future. So we look at Florida, we look at our region, we take into consideration the state of Florida's SCORP process, which I'm gonna try not to kill you with acronyms, but SCORP is the statewide comprehensive outdoor recreation plan. It's the plan that the state of Florida uses to grade, um, to grade grant applications, are you fulfilling the requirements for this portion of Central Florida to cover the gaps in outdoor recreation needs? So we take all those into consideration and start to try and forecast using all of the data that we have access to what's gonna be pertinent and important to Deltona. We also do a needs assessment, and this is really, the needs assessment is the meat of what we do as part of the parks and recreation planning process. So there's really two components, what we see and what we hear. And that's what I'm gonna cover very briefly tonight because that's the point in the process that we're at right now. So Kaylin will be talking about the statistically valid survey, giving you all an overview. We actually brought uh, 20 copies of the survey report. So you have a hard copy of it, but it was also linked in your agenda of the highlights of the survey. She'll talk to you a little bit about the process and how they get statistic validity as we go through that process. And then what we see in the field. We spend a lot of time, we've actually visited all of your parks. We've created a very robust GIS database that geolocates and photo documents all of your equipment, all of your parks. We can, uh, we have an interactive website built with, uh, um, with the city parks department where they can zoom in on a park. They can look at a point, they can look at that particular playground, that basketball court, they can look at 
our consultant professional opinion of that equipment, and then that whole overall, what we saw and what we heard, forms the needs assessment, because from there we can really tell where your gaps in service are. And then we'll move forward to level of service standards. So just a little bit, um, very briefly overview of how we collect the data. This gets into the technical end, but we do go out in the field. Everything we do, again, is geo-referenced in a GIS database. We collect everything right on our phones. I don't have mine in my pocket. We collect everything right on our phones through a database. Andrea leads the inventory process. She's a trained landscape architect, so she has the real eye on where um, you know where we have circulation problems, what the condition of our facilities look like, things like that. We work across the state of Florida. We actually work across the southeast. So we have what you would call an unbiased professional eye when it comes to things. We know that there's a lot of opinions on um, people about field conditions, basketball conditions, but what we try and do is we try and compare it to standard like-sized cities in Florida, as well as what we see, because we see a lot of things. And so in, in some systems, something that might be really, really great might be average to what, what, what we would see. And then other things, people may, we may have a client say, our fields are all in terrible condition. And we kind of laugh and we like, no, your fields are in very acceptable condition. You should see what we see out there. So we try and take a, a very subjective process and make it so we've standardized it when we do our inventory, just based on our professional experience. So just like a really quick, oh, here's the PowerPoint, just a really quick overview of what the city can see on the back end. You can see we've got, um, this is one of, just a screenshot of the GIS layers that we can look at. Um, we've got all the parks in there. We've got the city boundaries. We've got Volusia County parks. We've got schools. Because when we start to talk about parks and recreation, we don't want to just talk about strictly your parks and how are we going to fill gaps in level of service. We want to look at all public facilities. So as you zoom in and out of different layers, they, we can look at the conditions, how many playgrounds you have, all of that. So it's very, um, a lot of technology involved and it really makes it on the back end. Ideally, you never have to do a full inventory again because we turn over the GIS database to the city and as something gets changed, say a new park gets brought online or a basketball court gets replaced, those fields can be directly, and when I say fields, I mean GIS database fields, can be directly updated in the database and when you go to update your Parks and Recreation Master Plan in the future, all of that is already in place, which is um, really leveraging technology and helping it work for you over the course of the life of a plan. So in Deltona, um, what we inventoried were 28 active amenities. An active amenity would be a field, a soccer field, a football field, a playground. A passive amenity might be something like at your nature park, an observation deck, or a boardwalk, something that isn't as heavily used. 32 buildings, these would include everything from picnic pavilions to your event center. Sports courts, those are like tennis courts, those types of things. Um, sports fields, and then 234 furnishings. So we count your trash cans and your, um, and your benches through all this too. So we've got a full inventory. You can see this is one of our um, staff members out there. We were wearing yellow shirts when we did the inventory. So we were easily identifiable, but took all of that into consideration. So I just wanted to take a break here. This is our first pause. And knowing that we have visited all of your parks, but we might not remember all of them right off the top of our head, wanted to hear some you know, candid feedback from the commission on things as we're wrapping up our existing conditions report. If there's anything you wanna to talk to us about your, um, your existing parks. Commissioners, commissioners, do you have any um, questions uh, regarding the existing conditions? If you look later on your agenda, we have general facility and building conditions under item B, so um, and facility use agreements under item D. So I don't think either of those two are separate agreement or separate items on the agenda. So we have no questions. No. 
then we'll carry on. Okay. Thank you. Wonderful. All right, so the next section of the presentation, I'm gonna turn it over to Kaylin, and I'm gonna have her give you an overview of the survey methodology. You can see Kaylin on your screen, and Kaylin, if you just wanna tell me when to flip slides, I'll do that for you. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. Thank you so much, Kristen, and um, I'm excited to be here and present on some of the findings from the survey research that we did. Um, I am a research analyst here at uh, our RC Associates. We're a market research firm based in Colorado, and we've been doing survey research for over 40 years, and we specialize in parks and recreation surveys, so we've done hundreds of these around the country and have worked with GIA, GIA a number of times as well. So for our two methods of data collection, the primary method was the statistically valid survey, which was a mailed survey and a postcard with access to an online survey as well. And these were password protected and it was sent to a random sample of residents throughout Deltona. We received 319 of the statistically valid surveys and 294 of the open link surveys, which was an online um, accessible survey open to the general public of Deltona. Um, and we also sent out a reminder postcard to help encourage participation. I know the city worked hard to get the word out as well, and we appreciate that effort. We did get a, a good sample size, so we're happy with that and happy with the results as well. Can I just we ask how many you go. mailed out? How many did you mail out? Uh, we mailed 4,000 surveys. Thank you. Yep, yep, so you can see um, at the top here, we have 4,000 surveys mailed and 5,752 postcards. So we did a mailing of the paper survey along with postcards to let residents know um, a, a reminder about the survey. And then we followed up with a couple additional uh, 1,752 additional postcards uh, to help boost participation. <clears throat> and you can go to the next slide, Kristen. So once we received that data back and had it um, all sorted, we went ahead and weighted the data to better represent the city of Deltona. And so we weighted by age, ethnicity, and the districts. And the districts are pretty equally rep representative in population as well as um, with our weighting. And uh, only the invite sample was weighting, so that was weighted, and that's the primary sample that we take a look at. But uh, the open link is available there as well. And one thing to highlight is the invite sample and the open link sample are relatively similar which is a good sign of the, the quality of data and the general consensus throughout the community. And, yep. So he, here we have highlighted some of the key findings. Um, it's a little bit text heavy, but I, I'll point out um, some of the key points to pay attention to. So one of the first couple questions, the first couple questions were about living in Deltona. And there's a spread of newer residents as well as older residents with an average length of resi residency of 16.7 years. And as, we, as I previously mentioned, the population is pretty well dispersed across the city of Deltona um, in the different districts. Um, we also did take a look at a couple of these questions by district and that's in the full report to see if there were any differences by area of town. And another common theme I wanna highlight as we look at these key, key findings is uh, the importance of trails and paths. That was something that continued to come up in the different types of questions. Uh, for satisfaction on a scale of one to five, with five being very satisfied, the average rating for parks and recreation opportunities within the city was 3.7 for the endpoint invite sample and 3.4 for the open link. So overall, that's a, that's a pretty good score. Um, you know, there is some room for improvement there, but uh, 3.7 out of five is still highly satisfied. So um, just a good metric to keep in mind. Um, we looked at current usage. For the in, in, invite respondents, they are most frequent users of city parks trails and pathways, and special events. Um, some other mentioned 
uh, amenities of parks are restrooms and playgrounds and boardwalks and overlooks. For transportation, most people travel to parks and recreation facilities by vehicle, approximately nine out of 10. But there's still a portion of the invite sample who choose to use more active transportation, such as walking or running and bicycling. And respondents are most willing to walk to a nature park or a local park. And about 50% of the sample would prefer to walk 10 to 15 minutes to a local park. And another 18 to 25% would be willing to walk more than 15 minutes. And then about 30% of the open lake respondents that say that they are willing to walk no more than 10 minutes to each location. You can go to the next slide. And feel free to jump in if there's any questions as well. So for current conditions, uh, we did see some, some good feedback here. Walkways and trails, city parks and open spaces and amenities at city parks are the most important for both the invite and the open link sample. And these three facilities are all also highly rated as meeting the needs of the community. So that's a, a good sign that they're both important and the city's doing a good job to take care of these, these services for the community. For the open link sample, Special events was rated in the high importance, but a lower needs met category, which could be an area to possibly improve in the future. And respondents said that additional lighting, improved communication about offerings, and improved safety and security would help increase the use of Deltona Parks and Recreation facilities, programs, and services. And that's kind of a good segue into this next main section, which was communication. So uh, on the survey, they were asked on a scale of one to five, with five being very effective, how effective is a city um, communicating parks and recreation opportunities? And the average rating was 2.6. So there's some room to improve there. And currently most of the invite sample re received communication via word of mouth and over half of open link respondents receive information about social media, but their preferred communication would be email, the activity guide or brochure and social media. We also looked at future facilities, programs and services and the most important needs for improvement over the next five to 10 years are additional trails and paths that connect throughout the city. So that, that was mentioned in terms of importance currently and also looking towards the future. More activities for kids and making improvements to and or renovating existing parks or facilities. So those were the top three areas of uh, improvement over the next five to 10 years. But uh, more senior programs and additional summer programs for kids was also mentioned. So just keeping in mind different programs and services for all age ranges, uh, whether it's kids, adults, or seniors, that it was something that we heard from the community. Um, but the top priority was trails and paths that connect throughout the city. And the invite sample was more likely to say activities for kids while the invite sample would like the city to make improvements to in or renovate existing parks or facilities. The open link sample also feels more strongly about a new aquatic center and overall there wasn't much support for a new gym gymnasium. And then ways to finance these program services and facilities um, the lowest supported method were, were taxes, which is something that we see pretty much in all of our studies, but the samples were more, much more open to private public partnerships and bond referendum for specific projects. And something else I wanted to highlight here was that approximately 20 to 22% of both samples say that fee increases would not limit participation. So um, some, good, some good information there while we move forward to figure out how, how to finance some of these parks and recreation opportunities.
And those were the uh, key findings I wanted to highlight. Um, Kristen, did you want to add anything else? And I'm happy to answer any questions from the commission as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I wasn't sure if I was back on or not. So uh, thanks, Kaylin. I appreciate that. So the survey obviously was two components. It's a very data rich. We have a lot of information pertaining to it. We could talk about it for hours, truly. Um, we wanted to take another pause here and get any feedback or any questions while Kaylin's still uh, with us for the meeting. But I do want to go back and emphasize the difference between the statistically valid and the open link survey that she covered at the beginning. So a statistically valid survey for parks and recreation is hugely important, especially as you go through the accreditation process, because it's sometimes very difficult to engage people who are not active interactors with the city. So we wanna make sure when we do a statistically valid survey that it's statistically representative of the demographics and the population in Deltona. So we worked with staff, we use a GIS boundary for each of the commission districts, each of your districts, and we do ask respondents to self-identify based on a map what district they live in. Um, and that is all tracked through the, uh, the um, invite survey is all has a number so we can tell who's responded when they send follow-up postcards. That way we can tell exactly what commission district they're in and make sure that we're appropriately representing, again, maybe some underrepresented demographics, and that way we can match what's going on in Deltona. The open link survey, on the other hand, uh, we worked, Mr. Reckley's department worked wonderful with us, pushed out a lot of really great videos. We incentivized participation. Um, there were some gift cards awarded and some free program registrations awarded. Oftentimes with open link, it, there might be a specific user group who <laughs> distributes it heavily and we, there's a lot of participation by a specific user group in an open link because again, anyone can respond to that, so sometimes you can see information skew a little bit. Um, to, in Deltona, that didn't happen as often as we usually see that happen, which means that the data that came in is even reinforcing more. But I do wanna mention before we get into questions, what we do with that now is, and I'll talk about this a little bit in the next steps, but we're still gonna move to open public meetings. So we're gonna take, what again, what we saw in the field and what we heard through the survey, and we're gonna test it with public meetings coming up in the next phase of the project. So with that, um, questions, comments, methodology questions while Kaylin's on the phone. <laughs> Commissioner Sosa, were you on the board? Did you have a Oh, she answered. Okay, Commissioner McCool. My only comment is that data is king. Thank you for that. Um, the GIS, I absolutely love that. So thank you very much for presenting this data-rich um, mm -hmm. report here. Okay, thank you. That's okay, good. great. All right, so the um, final section of, Caitlin, thank you for joining us. If you just want to hang on for a few more minutes while I finish up, but then... We're good, I appreciate it. She's the statistician, I barely play one on TV, so I wanna make sure that all of those real statistic heavy questions she's there to cover. So um, really quickly on the next steps and through the process, um, we're going to um, wrap up the existing conditions that will be provided electronically to, um, to the Parks and Recreation Department. It'll be a great picture of where you're at today. Then we'll move into the next phase of the process, which is what does all this fun mean and how can we create a better Deltona for everyone? So again, we will have open public meetings. We're so happy to be able to meet with people face to face again. It makes a much more enriching environment and a much better environment for getting information. Um, we'll develop guiding principles. So the guiding principles might be something like based on hearing in the survey that trails and walking is really important. A guiding principle might be everyone who lives in Deltona should be able to walk to a park within 10 minutes of their home. So if that becomes a guiding principle underneath that, we will test that out in the public, make sure that makes sense. And then we'll start to look at, all right, where are our geographic gaps in connectivity in Deltona? How can we connect park to park? How can we connect our neighborhoods to the event center, whatever it may be, and then recommendations will come out from that. And you know, fill this segment from point A to point B, those types of things. 
Ultimately, then that will turn into a capital improvement program that we um, are happy and very proud to try our best to keep up with fluctuating construction costs, but at least give you an idea of how much you plan to spend, work with the city to understand how can um, we integrate into the city budget, a nice mix of general fund and understanding people's threshold for fees and charges for usage of programs and facilities, and then ultimately um, CAPRA accreditation. So um, I'm just gonna run through this really quickly, give you an idea of some of the experience-based workshops we do when we do public meetings. Um, we don't get up and talk to residents. Um, we don't make presentations and expect them to be able to stay awake after their work day. So we make them interactive and fun for all ages. We encourage kids. We do lots of activities for kids too at the public workshops. Um, we may have another online survey that's specific and more targeted to dig in deeper. Um, again, that would just be, um, that would not be statistically valid. We've got that in place. Um, we like to do mapping exercises. Everybody loves maps. Everybody loves maps. So looking at mapping, letting people talk to us one-on-one, -on -one. this is where I live, this is where I be, wanna be able to walk to. Um, we've done activities like build your own park, utilizing virtual reality and Instagram boards, which is always fun for all ages. Um, with the idea of creating advocates for the park system. So based on all of these data points, um, we again will identify emerging themes and this is just a sample one, but it could very well um, have, some of these could resonate with Deltona. So connected communication, something that's very important. One of the larger areas of, for improvement based on the survey. So how are we gonna make recommendations to improve um, communication? Um, trails and pathways, safety and inclusivity, um, distinct user experiences, things that are specialized but that you wanna have maybe spread out across the city that are um, specific to Deltona and something that people and the residents of Deltona really want. And then canopy and wildlife. So again, these are just samples of emerging themes that have come out of other projects. And from there, after we've tested them with the public, that becomes the guiding principles that will inform the plan and inform the recommendation and put a dollar figure to all of this fun. So just some samples of what recommendations might look like using equity and inclusivity as one of them. Um, parks are accessible and you all have an ADA study going on. This is partly ADA, but also accessible as in you can walk there, you can bike there, or you can drive there. Um, they're equitable. In other words, one area of the city doesn't have all the nice parks and other areas of the city has the parks that have been so well loved over the years that they need some updates. So we really try and spread the love evenly the best that we can. And then inclusive. In other words, there's something for all ages, all interests to do at the park that makes them safer. It makes them more engaging. So some of the example recommendations are each resident would live within a 10 minute walk or five minute drive. Again, Again, this is a sample not specific to Deltona, but just to kind of get your juices flowing on things that we might look like, look for. Each park provides facilities usable by people of all ages and abilities, and each park promotes safe and inclusive space for all users. Sounds pretty good, right? <laughs> So that is the end of the presentation. I just wanted to see, um, this is our last pause, see if there was any feedback that you all have from us on guiding the future or something that you'd like to tell us before we move on forward with your plan. Commissioners, any questions? Um, what, what is your timeline for public scoping? For the public meetings? Yes. Uh, we will aim for the fall. We try not to do public meetings in the summer. We've gotta come back to you and present existing conditions when that report gets wrapped up. Right now we have all the data, but we haven't put it in a succinct report. And then we'll come back to you for approval to move forward with the next phase of the project. But it's too hard to do public meetings in the summer. So um, we wait till school gets back in. Thank you. You're welcome. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I got so much stuff here. To do the uh, public meetings, um, and thank you, by the way, it's a very nice presentation. Would you be uh, uh, contacting the residents the same way you contacted them to get these feedbacks, or? 
Well, there, we anticipate there it being a mix of open public workshops, so we would rely on your public relations um, person, Lee, to help us with that. We don't rely on Ryan to help us with getting the word out, you all. We know word of mouth is effective in Deltona. It would not be a direct mailing. This is more face-to-face -face and interactive. So we're always open to different ways to reach the community and get them there. But we'll also do some specific meetings with user groups like that we call focus groups. So we might ask that um, Mr. Reckley help us to put together groups of, oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, there's a camera in my face. Now I'm blushing. <laughs> we, we, it's very distracting for me. I'm sorry, I'm not used to that. Um, <laughs> okay. Let's see here. So anyway, um, we will try and meet with user groups and stakeholders and, and try and get a real triangulated process based on um, using this statistically valid survey and sort of deploying that to the residents. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner King? Yeah, I just have uh, one question right now. Um, how did you come up with the number 4,000? I uh, knew Kaylin needed to stay on. <laughs> Kaylin, did you hear his question? How did you come up with the number 4,000? Yes. So we kind of work backwards. We start with the population of Deltona um, and then we, from there, figure out the response rate that we would need to get a good margin of error size. So 4,000 tends to be a good number for a for majority of our typical surveys. Um, and our goal is you typically to get around 400 completed responses, and that would get our margin of error slightly lower than what it is for Deltona, which is 5.5. Four, we, we aim for around five. So 4,000 tends to be kind of a lucky, a good number for the size of your community and um, helps us to reach that number of 400 completed surveys. So out of the 4,000, you got 400 responses? You didn't get that we many got responses, 319. Right? It is, it's difficult to get people to complete surveys. So we do, we do try our best. And I think the uh, reminder postcard helped, helped raise that number as well. Okay. But um, it is pretty typical for, for um, parks and recreation surveys with 4,000 mailed. We're aiming for 400 complete. All right. I was just wondering with as many people as we have in the city, 4,000 isn't even close to a quarter of that. So I was, so what you're really saying is the data, the information that you've gotten so far is based on 300 people in the city. Is that correct? About? For the statistically valid portion and what makes it statistically valid is it's a random sample. So they were um, evenly spread throughout the city and that helps um, get a, comprehensive idea of the general preferences and attitudes of, of the city of Deltona. And okay. I, I, we hear that question all the time because the numbers are, are baffling, but that's why we rely on our statisticians for this and why the importance of weighting the data to make sure that we're not over, over representing any demographic in Deltona, so when in the, you know, it's a fat, fat report. So when we start to look at it, if we identify a specific commission district and the female responses underperformed the male responses, which is typical, women answer surveys, right? That's just what we do. Um, we make sure that that particular area is, the data is weighted by the fact that there's more men, in, and I'm just, again, giving an example, there's more men in that area. So it might reduce the value of the female response to make sure that it balances. And that's why it's a very scientific process. And I really wanted Kaylin on the phone to cover this because it is, it quite frankly is the most scientific thing that we do besides the cost estimate. <laughs> okay. Well, just for the record, let me just say that our citizens need to participate 
in these kind of activities. And, and for those that don't participate, and you want to point your finger up at these folks on the dais, like we're making decisions and you don't know anything about it or it's, it, you don't like it, you have opportunities like this to really participate in what's going on in the city that can really make a difference in your quality of life. So I, I say that to say there are going to be other surveys and there's going to be other meetings about this, and it behooves the citizens of this city to come out and participate so that we know what you think and what you would like to see. And if you don't come out, you, you almost negate your, your ability to, to do anything. I mean, we want to do what you want us to do, but you have to, you have to respond. So that's all I got for right now. I, I was just wondering, that's, uh, that's not a, a large number of people, but I understand what you're saying in the science of it. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, th thank you. Any other questions? Uh, 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 uh. Ladies and gentlemen, we're good. No other questions from the commission? Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Great job, and we look forward to the next step. Yes, thank Madam you all Mayor. for allowing us time tonight and to work with us. We appreciate it very much. Yes, sir. Madam Mayor, I just want to let everybody know there's file-bound copies of the survey on the back table uh, for those of you all who want to pick up a copy. Okay, great. Thank you, Kaylin. Yeah, thank you. Bye. Okay, Mr. Peters, next item up, discussion regarding general facility and building conditions. Yes, ma'am, I'm letting Lee get to, um, oh, you got it behind me, okay. Um, what I'm, I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna do a general uh, picture overview, uh, this is, uh, not necessarily representative, but it does provide some insight into some of the conditions that we're dealing with um, with regard to our facilities. Okay, Lee. Oh, there we go. We moved. At Dewey Boster. This is um, a view of outside of our, um, one of our facilities. We have uh, the uh, aluminum benches that are sitting on the ground. Um, we have more um, stuff laying around, um, more stuff. Um, this is, as an engineer, this one scares the bejesus out of me. Um, in fact, McKippolo and I agree that we would never go under that overhang up there. Uh, if you notice, it, it overhangs quite a bit, and there's a couple of little uh, two by sixes or whatever on a 45 degree angle holding up the uh, balcony area. Uh, but that just gives you a general idea um, of the uh, barn facility out at Dewey Boster and the area around it. Uh, the next location is Lakeshore Arts and Craft Building. This is down on Lake Shore on Lake Monroe, one of our premier pieces of property. Um, we have a foundation failure. That zigzag you see in the block, if for engineers, a classic symbol of uh, a foundation failure. Uh, what's really distressing about this is the distance from the beginning of the crack to the corner. Uh, that tells you that whole portion of the foundation has failed. Uh, it would require jacking up, reinforcing the foundation, and uh, repairing the joints. Um, then when you go out on the front porch, uh, you see a lot of black area in the ceiling where the rainwater has come through the uh, porch area. To give you a view close up, it's pretty disgusting. Uh, obviously in need of repair uh, in the roof area. Then inside, this is just one of two rooms. We have a lot of uh, things stored. Uh, this is actually the better room. Uh, the other room is uh, literally so full you can't get pictures of it all. So I'm not gonna try to do it. 
Um, the next location is the uh, ABAC building at Dewey Boster. Um, once again, we have a lot of storage outside. That is a rock climbing uh, equipment. Um, and we have an open dumpster um, and other stuff. But uh, if you notice in the eave up here, there's a separation in the boards uh, where the weather is able to get into the building. Um, there's nothing to prevent it from occurring. Um, then at Festival Park at the uh, barn and the trailer. Um, this is the barn. Um, it is corrugated metal, a uh, lot of rust occurring. Um, the wood fascia is in bad shape. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, debris and things around the site in front of it. This is one end of the trailer. Uh, you can see that the air conditioning uh, heating system over there is completely rusted out. Um, then when I go to the next picture, whoops, you want to, no. Next picture is more pictures of the stuff that's around it, just laying around. Uh, we have PVC pipe, which I'm assuming is irrigation pipe. Problem with this is by having it out in the sun, it becomes bleached. And when PVC pipe gets bleached, it becomes very brittle. So essentially, this is pipe that we can't use. Uh, if we did use it, it would break very quickly under any amount of pressure. So um, then this is what's inside. Um, looks like Halloween fall stuff. Um, we have a coffee maker in the back wall. Um, All right, then the next facility is the Campbell Park Boxing. This um, raised his ugly head recently where we said he had to condemn the building. And I think when you see these pictures, you will understand why. Uh, this is a view of the overall interior. You see the colored ceilings. You see chipped flooring uh, to kind of emphasize the flooring situation. Uh, you will see that uh, there are waste over there. The floor is pitted from heavy objects being dropped on it. Um, and then my favorite is, oh, let me back up for you. You can see the uh, ceiling is damaged. Um, and then when you go in closer, actually removed the ceiling, made structural modification to the wood trusses uh, in order to hang the heavy bags. Um, I don't believe I had a picture of it, but uh, we did get a picture. That particular day it was raining and the rainwater was coming down through the trusses. Um, so there's obviously uh, the roof of the building has been compromised uh, to the extent that water is coming through. And then this is the restroom. Somebody uh, thought it would be a nice idea to knock a hole in the wall, uh, but the toilet itself, I would not go in the bathroom there. Uh, the building was just in deplorable condition. Um, but I just wanted to show you, you know, a few of these pictures. Um, what I showed you is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, we have, uh, unfortunately, a lot of material that's stored at all of our parks. Uh, they're stored in a manner that they deteriorate quickly over time. We have buildings that are in dire need of major repairs and upgrades. Um, so as you, you probably can't read it on the bottom, but it said this is where ABM comes in. Uh, so with that, we are recommending two things. Uh, the first one is to award a contract with ABM. Uh, we previously approved uh, <clears throat> ABM on a piggyback contract on their Boynton Beach contract to do an assessment of all of our facilities for ADA compliance, for uh, building conditions and recommendations and a priority list for repair work and reconstruction to occur going forward. The second thing is 
I'm requesting that the City Commission authorize uh, myself uh, and my staff to do a complete inventory of all these items that are in the building, on the grounds, make it a determination of what items uh, should be uh, disposed of, whether it be through auction or for those things of value, or simply throw away those things that have no intrinsic value. Uh, once that disposal process is complete, uh, we will report back to commission in conformance with the city code, uh, a list of the items that we disposed of so the commission can, after the fact, approve the disposal of this uh, material. So those are the two items. Um, I have a second agenda item on the ABM contract, but I would like to do right now get consensus or better yet a motion and a vote to authorize um, myself and staff to do that inventory of our supplies and things that are in the various buildings and grounds so that we can dispose of them properly. So you're asking for a motion and a vote to inventory what we have in I'm going to say all of our parks, all of our storage units, including those that are outside of the city, all of the trailers that we have, all of the storage things that, and sheds that we have, that, that we have for storage. You're asking for? I'm asking for authorization for us to begin that process. And this is going to, just to be clear, include every single storage and every single building where we have stuff, including the commission chambers. A lot of stuff. Commissioner Ramos? Uh, yes, Madam Mayor, I'll make a motion in reference to what the city manager is just asking, giving him authorization for an inventory of all stored property. Second. Properly moved by Commissioner Ramos, seconded by Commissioner King. Commissioner Sosa, you are on the board. I just have a question. You know, this is obviously this has gone on for a long time for this these buildings and that to be in the shape that they're in. What are you going to do to ensure there's accountability that all the buildings are up to speed? There's not a bunch of wasted material sitting around. I mean, how, how are you going to hold anybody accountable for that? Um, because I will get personally involved. Um, is it going to be a yeoman's effort? Um, but the only way I can be satisfied that we're doing it properly is I will personally have to get involved and literally go to the various sites and say, no, this stuff got to be thrown away. Uh, this stuff had, like, for instance, that um, the auction craft building in the, in the main room, we have exercise equipment that used to be upstairs in the exercise room that nobody used. Um, it has value. Uh, what I would like to do is have an auction uh, to where, you know, somebody can purchase it. Uh, we will strict city employees that they cannot make purchases during this, op this auction because I don't want any perception that we are disposing of something so that you know, somebody on staff could purchase it. Um, there will be you know, no city employees being allowed to uh, purchase any of this stuff. Now we have three popcorn poppers over there. We got a dunk tank. Uh, there is a significant amount of stuff that has value. Um, the other thing I want to point out is one of the things that we've been having some discussions about internally for long-term storage. If we have a water tank, a 300,000-gallon water tank over off of Cortland, I believe Cortland, um, it is essentially about a 50-foot diameter by 21-foot tall water tank. Um, in my previous employee elsewhere, I took a water tank, put two sets of doors on it, uh, made it an IT facility. One of the beauties of using a water tank is it's 72 degrees year-round. Uh, the only thing you have to do is put a dehumidifier in there. Uh, you can put what I call high bay shelving like you see at Costco and Sam's. Um, the perimeter of the tank is 150 feet, 21 feet high, with four sets of shelves. So you can imagine how much storage you can get inside of one of those water tanks. Uh, so that's my commitment is when we're said and done, uh, we will have a storage facility. Obviously, we'll come back to commission with a contract. Um, and we will inventory everything that goes in there so that if somebody needs to know where uh, Joyce's file is for 1997, uh, we would know which box in the storage building it's in. 
so that's my long-term goal is to create a storage facility using one of our um, water tanks that's no longer in service. Now, are you going to keep any kind of written documentation for maintenance logs on fields or buildings? I mean, be, because I'm looking at some of these buildings, and I've been telling you this for quite a while now, and yes, I, I can't find any accountability anywhere for them. I, I appreciate what you're saying, sir, and a big part of the ABM contract is to develop those standards, um, the uh, record-keeping process, um, and that type of information, because right now we're sorely lacking in the work orders and the documentation that I would expect. Um, you know, be very candid with you, the level of documentation that you get in Deltona Water and, and Public Works is different than the level of documentation we're currently getting in the Parks and Rec and Building Maintenance area. That is my goal, is to get to that level. Okay. Now, in the Festival Park, the pictures there, was that part of the Public Works Depot? Because I don't remember a trailer actually sitting in Festival Park. Um, if you go down the, um, the dirt road to Festival Park, uh, it's on that road. Um, and so that particular facility is a parks and rec facility, is okay. my understanding. But it's fenced in within the public works building. There are some public works areas that need yeah. TLC out there also. We have pallets of topsoil with uh, grass and weeds growing out of it. That will be dealt with That will, from the stormwater division. All right. Thank you. Commissioner McCool. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> I wanted to, to make a comment and then ask a question that in remembering what we're, what our vision is, what our goals are, that sometimes you're so busy working in your business, you can't work on your business. And that's what has, I believe, occurred. We have gone through some stuff where we've been busy working in the business day to day, putting out fires or operations. So Mr. Peters, we have the staff now, the staff levels, correct, to do this, to get this organized, to the staff has support to um, take care of this and the parts like we talked about and then whatever you might have, the, the other stuff, stormwater, whatever, I mean, just to get organized, correct? Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, just so you all know, um, I developed a, several spreadsheets using national standards that I have used in previous employees. Um, we have 23 what I call nature parks. Um, the general rule of thumb is you have one person per uh, uh, 50 acres. Um, and then we have our developed parks, which are 23 uh, rule of thumb is one person for every 20 acres. So you take a Dewey Boxer Park that's 60 acres, we should have three people dedicated to Dewey Park. Uh, Dewey Boxer. Using the numbers here and also looking at the number of square foot of buildings we have, um, and in that case, we use a factor of one person for every 50,000 square feet of buildings. Um, we have adequate staffing as it is now. Now, the building acreage I still got to work on because. That was based on our larger buildings. We have a significant number of smaller buildings that were not included. And quite frankly, they sometimes take more work. For instance, a standalone restroom in a park um, takes a lot more um, maintenance requirement than a, a city hall. Mm -hmm. uh, because you were dealing with the restroom, you got the trash, you got the floor cleaned up and all that. So we will have to have a factor for the restroom just not included. but. Even with that, we do have adequate staff. And, and question there also, I'm not questioning um, staff allocation or anything like that, but just for my own edification, because I know that we do, we do some special events, right, uh, on those days. We, our, our people work themselves to the bone. They really, they really do when we're pulling off these. Um, so I just want to understand and, and make sure do the staff have, do we have like maintenance, right? A regular maintenance crew as above, as opposed to like a fields crew where, where everybody knows what their assigned task is and we have the allocation for that? Or does everyone just kind of do everything? Uh, let me answer it with an example. Sure. City Hall. Yep. City Hall, I've been here 20 years. 
Um, there are a significant number of offices and hallways that have never been painted since the building opened. Um, we have carpet that has never been changed since the building opened. Um, for a commercial building, that's an unacceptable level of maintenance. A lot of that has to do with lack of funding um, and you know, people not bringing forward that we needed to do the work. And that's part of what ABM is going to help us with is to go through the building. Obviously, a foundation failure is going to be a higher priority than painting the city manager's office. Um, I know you want to get rid of my red wall, but you're going to have to wait. Um, but you know, what I'm looking for from ABM is to do the things that we don't have the time to. Um, it's much like, and, and I apologize for the example, but it's like a hoarder. Um, you know, once you get to a point that the stuff is all the way to the ceiling, uh, it takes a while to deal with it. Uh, a house that hasn't been maintained in 20 years, it takes a while to do the repair work. Uh, you go through City Hall, there's a lot of uh, corners on walls <laughs> where the, um, the sheetrock and the plaster is chipped. Uh, it hasn't been repaired for years. Um, thank the Lord it's inside and not outside because it would have been rusted by now. Um, so those are the things we got to deal with. And, and I get that. Thank you, okay, for clearing that. I guess that my main point is that, you know, looking at these pictures, I'm just saying this for my public because I've had this conversation, right? Look at these pictures, it looks like we don't care or that we have employees that don't do stuff, and that's simply not true. We have really hardworking staff here. We have an, an abundance of stuff to do. That's that's the, the thing. So organizing and, and getting a good inventory. This is an inventory. It's fact-finding and then fact-facing, you know, and, and that's what we are doing to improve the quality of these, and I just want, you know, people that... that that we that I've talked to that have asked me about this stuff um, to understand that that's what we're doing right now to make everything better uh, for you know what I mean As, and it said that it doesn't cost more in the future also because it is um, prices of things are escalating every you know what I mean we don't have control over that so I'm just trying to bring that to light Miss McCool to in furtherance of your point um, Back in the late 2000s, when the economy was very bad, the city cut the Parks and Recreation staff by 17 people. The commission approved in the last budget in October to rehire those 17 people. So we went over 10 years with totally inadequate staffing level to properly take care of what we have. We're trying to correct that, much like we did with code compliance. We're bringing people in to assist us in the process to get us to the point that we need to be. That's part of what the accreditation process is for. It creates levels of standards on how we move forward. I, I'm square. Thank you. Vice Mayor and then Commissioner Bradford. Thank you, Mayor. So I think a lot of the questions that I had written down, Commissioner Sosa um, mentioned them, but one of the questions I'm asking is, how many inspectors does the city need to visit each of our recreations or our buildings to see what condition they're in? Because obviously, the pictures that you showed us didn't happen overnight. It took quite a few days for them to get into that condition, right? Mr. S uh, Commissioner Sosa also, also mentioned a report. Usually there is a piece of paper on a wall when somebody inspects something, when it was inspected, who inspected it, the condition that it was found, and the suggestion of what needs to be done. And depending on the condition, that's the urgency of how it, it gets addressed, right? Absolutely correct. So obviously, none of that was done. None of it was done. Um, and that's what brought these um, buildings in the conditions that they are now. We have buildings that can be used for rentals. 
I have been approached by Boy Scouts. I have been approached by other youth organizations that would like to use our facilities to meet, and we can't even afford to, to give them one. Um, so, and, and, and it's because of lack of maintenance to these buildings. Um, I just had a town hall meeting at the community center, and I'm happy to say that it was in pretty good condition, right? It was got into conditions because of the town hall meetings. Otherwise, it would still be a mess. So we have these buildings that we can profit from instead of raising fees going forward. Am I correct? You are absolutely correct. Okay. Um, no, using the business model standpoint, when I see a building being used for storage, that's revenue that we can't make. Absolutely. And so that's what part of the reason that I'm ask, I am asked for permission to go through and dispose of what we don't need to keep. Um, you know, as I have said, you know, we had three popcorn poppers and uh, for the events that we would use it, like the, uh, uh, the movie in the park, we can go to one of the rental companies around here and rent a popcorn popper for the night for a lot cheaper than what mm -hmm. we're losing in revenue in the building to store it. So I, I know everyone see, saw these pictures here and at home, and I just want you to understand that the people using these buildings are not responsible for the condition of these buildings. Because if the city had inspected them on time and caught the damages on time, they would have been fixed on time. It's not the responsibility of the renters or the users to fix these buildings. It's the responsibility of the city. So I want everyone here to walk away not thinking that the people who are using our facilities are responsible for the condition of that, of the city, of, of the way they are. If something is found to be in bad condition, then it's up to the city to speak to the people or the organization that's using the building and either have them fix it or remove them. Leaving them in a building that's in bad condition, putting our people in danger, our children who go into this building, is the responsibility of the city, not the people that are using the city, the other buildings. Thank you. Commissioner Bradford. I'm gonna follow that lecture. Um, Ryan, staff, I, I first of all wanna say I'm sorry because I looked at those pictures and I'm gonna tell you what I didn't see. I didn't see storage racks, I didn't see shelving, I didn't see anything adequately for you guys to store the items away. And I, I guess on my side I'm saying, we failed, not just us, but them and you, we, we totally failed. I don't blame them because I'm looking at those pictures and I'm just like, where were they supposed to put this stuff? Because they're empty rooms, there's no storage. When I look at the rooms, you know, just like the vice mayor said, we're the landlords of those rooms and what system do we have in place so a tenant can initially respond to the landlord and say, hey, this needs fixed. And if some of those pictures were at residence homes, they would be code enforced. So we're now practicing what we're preaching up here. And you know, if we're not giving them the tools, I, I don't know how you guys have put on such spectacular events. I, I give you kudos because you guys have put on some amazing events and to not have the organization that you need, I'm sorry and I'm embarrassed. So it's not just we gotta go in and we gotta fix that, we gotta give them the tools and it's not just them. It's like you said, Mr. Peters, what system is in place? And I'll be honest, I had staff a few years ago reach out to me and say, hey, come into this bathroom. I was disgusted. And that was in this facility. So if a, it's our responsibility to maintain these buildings, to maintain these facilities, and if a staff member's clearly reported that there's a problem, then I guess we need to figure out in the budget how are we going to balance this out and maintain them. Now we're talking last night about let's, let's do a echo grant to do another park. And I have to agree with the mayor's comment from the previous meeting, we gotta get our house in order. I can't, I, I can't say anything to these guys because these guys have done an outstanding job putting on events. My question is one, 
maintenance crews. What are the maintenance crews doing to assist with going around and cleaning it up? Because a lot of that stuff looked like it, we just needed a dumpster out there. And that's just my personal opinion. Um, shelving, storage. I mean, we can go out there and we can clean the problem up, but if we don't have it where there, it's not gonna get back in that same condition, then we've just cleaned a problem up that's just gonna continue to happen. You know, so that needs to be budgeted as well, is let's clean it up and let's figure out what we have to do to make sure that they're organized. You can take inventory all you want, but if they don't have a place to put this stuff, what, what good is it? So, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I can't say I'm sorry enough to you guys that you have not had the resources you've needed to adequately store and do what you guys need to do. And all I know is we gotta fix this and we need a plan to get it fixed. And I know you're saying because you're gonna oversee it and I'm not being rude and I'm not being a smart aleck, but what's to say in a few years if you ain't here, who's gonna oversee it then? So I, I, I'm just saying, you know, we need policies, we need procedures, we need something set up so that this does not happen again. I love the fact that, you know, you wanna oversee it and all that, but we all know what's been happening in the last how many years. I just wanna make sure that 10 years from now, 20 years from now, we're not gonna be back here. Ms. Bradford, I appreciate, I appreciate everything you said. Um, that's part of the reason I uh, brought forth a solution. Um, you know, I, you all know me well enough to know I don't bring you problems without a, a solution. Um, you know, we, we're way behind the eight ball. That's part of the reason we're bringing ABM to help out. Um, it's also why I suggested that we have a 300,000 gallon uh, water storage tank that can be converted into a bona fide storage facility that we can properly inventory. Um, literally having a computer at the door, you inventory what goes in and you inventory what goes out and where it's going uh, so that we know where it is. Um, you know, it's obvious that we have had a lack of storage in this city. Um, you know, when we do events and things of that nature, we buy things for the event, but then we got to store it somewhere. Um, and so that's why, you know, I'm suggesting a storage facility utilizing the water tank. ABM may have some other options that they would suggest with regard to uh, temporary or permanent storage facilities also. Um, I'm on record of being in favor of an inventory building so that um, we don't have people going to uh, Lowe's and Home Depot buying things that we would have in a facility uh, to expedite the process. But uh, we're committed to getting this thing corrected. Well, then who's gonna maintain the inventory building? Because obviously these guys are out here maintaining the parks, putting on events and doing that. It's just like, you can't have, just like Commissioner McCool said, they can't be working on and in the company at the same time. You know, it's just like we have a secretary. That secretary does what? She keeps us organized. She keeps everything organized. So I don't, I, I understand where that facility is gonna help, but so we pay them, I guess that's the 49,000. We pay them 49,000, they do that. Now, who's gonna maintain it? Who's gonna make sure that it stays that way? I mean, are we now looking at a staff member as well? Because they've got enough on their plate. There will be personnel that will be responsible for ensuring that it stays in a condition that is acceptable and meets the standards that we put in place. And they will be held accountable for doing that. A big part of that is going to be keeping uh, proper work orders, um, inventory lists, maintenance logs, all that is part of what's gonna be happening from this point forward so that we have accountability for our facilities. Commissioner Sosa. Who is responsible for bringing you what they need in each department? Can you ask that again? Who is responsible for bringing you what they need in each department? Well, during the budgetary process, each director brings forward their department budget for review. Okay. Were there shelves allocated in the budget this year? Were the what? Did anybody say we need shelves this year for storage? 
No. Okay. So there's your answer. Um, once again, it goes down to accountability. And I'll tell you, Mr. Peters, you're getting the brunt of this right now. And you're the one getting it because you're the one cleaning it up. This has been a problem for many years and nobody's touched it. They've kicked the can down the road. Now, you're, you've got to finally put your foot down. We need to get our facilities back up to speed. I've got a question. In the budget, how much money was allocated for maintenance, paint, replacing wood on fences, any of that? How much money was actually allocated? Sir, I don't have that exact answer. I don't think there was any. I didn't see anything for maintenance. Yeah. And, and that's, my, that's my biggest thing. We don't maintain, but we take millions of dollars and we build new things. If, if I didn't maintain my car, I sure as heck wouldn't have 250,000 miles on it right now. So we need to get maintenance a top priority. You know, some of those buildings, you look at them, they've never been cleaned in 25, 30 years. So the, here, my thing is, I don't wanna keep spending money if there's not gonna be any accountability mm -hmm. for routine maintenance. And if you got somebody reporting a problem, we need to take care of it. And when it comes to our facility use agreements, if we have somebody using our facilities, if they're tearing up our facilities, it's, you know, it, it's not the city's responsibility to keep repairing things. So let me, let me address that. Um, I'm a strong believer that when we rent out our facilities, ultimately the responsibility of maintaining that facility is ours. That's why we have an element on the agenda tonight to talk about the facility use agreements. Um, you know, we had a facility that we allowed a group to use um, that the, the building deteriorated. Um, you know, they didn't maintain it, we didn't maintain it, and the building had to be condemned. Uh, the only way that I can ensure that our buildings are kept in proper condition is that the city will maintain the facilities. So we need to have facilities use agreements that provide the adequate funding to ensure that those facilities are kept up. I know as a business owner, I gotta take 10% of whatever my income is every year to set it aside to make improvements. So th that's something to think about because I see some things on here. And if you are out in the private sector for some of these programs, you're gonna be looking at about $6,000 a year between rent, insurance and utilities, not to mention the upkeep on the building. So that, that's also, we have to take that into consideration as well. Okay, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Commissioner Sosa, you asked how much we have in maintenance for buildings in our budget book. In fiscal year 1920, we budgeted $117,000. Fiscal year 2021, $84,000, and this year $120,000. That's for repair and maintenance for building. It's a drop in the bucket. When we look at our budget right now, our budget from last year, fiscal year 2021, for salaries and wages was $1,190,800. This year it's $1,000,000. 745,000, increase of 46%. Our budget total operating expenses in 2020 to 2021 was 1,013,220. This year we're budgeted to $1,430,700, a 65% increase. We have a capital outlay replacement, last year 161,800, this year 800. $50,000, 425% increase. Fiscal year starts when? How many months are we into it? Almost six, almost a half a year. What have we accomplished? What have we accomplished for 46% budget increase in wages in a two hundred sixty-eight? percent increase in other contractual services, and a 65 percent increase in operating expenses. 
at the pictures. Been a, sitting up here in various roles for 11 years. Never seen all three buildings at Lakeshore Drive shut down for four years. Four years. Been in the schoolhouse lately. You didn't see pictures of that. It's a disgusting mess. Craft building, those were nice pictures, sir. You didn't see the other part of the storage. And there's plenty of storage room in that craft building for other stuff. Community center had four years worth of Hurricane Maria supplies sitting there. Four years sat there until it finally got cleaned out and dumped. Nobody moved it for four years. Mr. Peters, how many outside storage units are we paying for in the city of Daltona? Do you have any idea? Where are they located, sir? Howland Boulevard, you got three of them. Pardon me? You got three on Howland Boulevard at some storage unit. You got two containers at Festival Park next to that trailer you took pictures of where the insulation is coming out of the bottom. It's more than a code enforcement violation. It's been like that for two or three or four years because I've been down there, looked at it that long. Nothing's been done for all that time. Been to the EVAC building? Take a look at it. I remember sitting on this commission when it was dedicated to the city of Deltona from the county of Volusia, 2012, give or take. Take a look at it, the inside of it. It's got furniture in there I wouldn't put a feral cat on. For real. Campbell Park. Look at the back of the air conditioning, sitting one air conditioning unit, sitting on cement blocks. Air conditioning doesn't even work. Yet we have IT cameras in there, whole IT system in there. No AC. Nicest thing in that building is the IT camera system. Shall I keep going? We have other containers around this city. Van Park, container there. Little League asked us to go ahead and buy a machete at Lowe's because they don't want to pay the 125 bucks a month rental. You, sir, told me we have other storage facilities behind Diamond Street, behind the water tank down there. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. For all the money under the previous city manager that we have poured into Park and Rec, poured into Park and Rec, whether that money was spent or not, because it can be budgeted, because you go through your budget, we got this rookery park, we got all this other stuff, we got capital improvement projects sitting in here year after year after year, money just rolls over and it's not spent. Where is the accountability? And I agree with you, Commissioner Sosa, it's falling on him and his team right now. This didn't happen overnight. None of this happened overnight. The big question is, when we're gonna do something about it, where is the accountability? What reports are we gonna bring back? You have an inventory, the city has an inventory of every single item. Why do we have piles and boxes and decorations stuffed in the office, behind the concession stand at Dewey Boster with an $80,000 sound system sitting there with thrown on a table that's fallen apart, stacks of water, containers. It's everywhere. It's everywhere in this city. And you, and you, and you, and me would have been code enforcement violated, just like you said, Commissioner Bradford, if we had our homes and our properties looking this way, go to Festival Park. Look at the pile, you were kind on that also, of machinery sitting down there. Every place. I'm not gonna vote for one additional employee 
one additional dime in the next budget. You got six months before the beginning of the fiscal new fiscal year. What is being done? We have a motion on the floor and a second to begin an inventory process and get rid of some of this junk. Yes, sir. Madam Mayor, on that same note, Mr. Peters, how long do you think, the motion is in reference to give you the authorization to do an inventory. How long of a time do you think it would take for an inventory? Can you ask that again, please, sir? How long of a time would you need to do an inventory? How long would you need for an inventory? How long, how oh much of time would you um, need for Sir, <laughs> I cannot begin to answer that question um, because, you know, it kind of like, since I came on this as your acting city manager, uh, Mick Kipolo and I often joke that every time we turn a rock over, there's a viper. Um, my fear is that every time I go into another building, there's going to be more to deal with. Uh, so, you know, my commitment is, is six months, uh, but I will be giving you periodic reports uh, because, quite honestly, until I actually get out there and when we get out there and start going through it, uh, I, it's very difficult for me to answer that question. Well, I, if, if I would like to amend my motion just to make that part of the report part of the motion. Okay. Uh, giving you authorization, yes, to do an inventory, but to bring a back a report um, to this commission. Um, definitely before six months, you said you are going to give us periodic inventory. Uh, well, what report. I would do is we will give you a monthly dashboard um, that will list all the parts, what we have re uh, reviewed, Who's second and the what motion? we have removed. Commissioner King, he's good. Commissioner King, are you okay with my amendment? So, um, Joyce, did we get that? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Bradford. Not to throw more work, but I'm just gonna throw this out there looking at all these wonderful buildings. How can I turn a negative into a positive? Somehow we gotta do that. So I'm looking and wondering when we're doing a clean out, if there's items that could be donated to local schools, theaters, stuff like that. Maybe there's community groups. Is that a possibility? Because, you know, we always have different schools and churches and places that could use decorations or they're doing plays and they're drama and that. I, I would hate to see some of these items just trashed. You know, uh, obviously there's a lot that needs trash. Don't, don't get me wrong there. But as we're doing this inventory, you know, we may find that there's, you know what, we haven't used that in a while. We're not gonna use it again. Donate it to the schools or that, that would certainly be part of the process. If there is, uh, let's say, for instance, and I, I don't, I don't believe we have one of these. I may be corrected, but let's say we had a portable basketball goal that oh, wanted a high school, a portable basketball goal that wanted a high school could use. We would certainly offer it to one of the local schools to to take it. We should be featured on hoarders, hoarders municipal style. Yeah, and that's a good idea, you know? We we could have a big auction. I mean, that might be something that we do. A lot of, like an estate auction. Yep. Yeah, so I like that. I like the auction idea, but I also like contributing to our local schools that don't necessarily get the budget. So sometimes to me, it's not just about revenue, it's about community. Okay. May we vote, please? We do not have public comment on this item. Commissioner Bradford would like public comment on this. Has anyone signed up for public comment for the specific thing of having an, in, that we're voting on an inventory, to take an inventory of all existing items and put those that we, that they determine are not useful up for auction. Nothing on an inventory. Yes, sir. Let's go. I'm glad y'all are having this really heartfelt moment up there right now. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me because I remember six years ago, 
during budget hearings. This was brought up. And the lady that was sitting in his seat ignored us, completely ignored us. And for this little heartfelt moment y'all are having here, that has to include y'all ignoring us. Now, some of y'all weren't here six years ago, but it's amazing to me, truly amazing, that this has to come on to him when actually we have two people over here that are Parks and Recs. I'm sorry, Parks and Recs is supposed to be maintained by department head. Parks and Recs is supposed to be maintained budgetly by you. And yet six years ago, when this was brought up, and I can personally tell you, because I brought it up, that our buildings were a disaster and we put all this money into it. And the buildings are still a disaster. Oh, and the fields are kind of so-so. But here's the problem. He talks about accountability. You've been here, what, 11, 12 years now? Mr. Ramos, you've been here almost six years? Where is the accountability up there? I mean, I'm sorry. The man over here, you know, Bradford, I, you know, I, I, I hear you. He has a lot on his plate. But I'm sorry, a good Parks and Recs Department, the man gets shit done. And I have to wonder now, if you can't take care of your own house, why are you there? This obviously didn't happen overnight. That one building he showed, I can tell you, we can go back six years, we can see pictures of it just like that. So really, really? And you're feeling this heartfelt moment of, oh, something's gotta be done? Well, where was that six years ago? Thank you, sir. I have to agree with what Elbert said. This has been rehashed many, many times over the years, parks and rec, and uh, miss, the vice mayor there said this happened over a period of days. This has been years, miss, years this had to happen. You said days, you said days. You wanna go back at the video, look at it, you said days. And now you're telling that the, the, the landlord is not responsible. You rent something to somebody and the ceiling falls down or a pipe breaks, the landlord's not responsible for that? You were saying that, that it's the landlord. It's not the landlord responsible, it's the city. The city's responsible. And some of you have been there for many years. This has been rehashed, rehashed, rehashed. These people sitting out here, you're supposed to be stewards of their dollars. She's not doing a good job. I can't blame Mr. Sosa. I can't blame Mrs. McComb. They're, they're new. I can't blame John Peters. He's new. This falls on you, Heidi. And for you to sit there, act anger, and all of this acting that you do, come on. You're not in Hollywood. You'll never be in Hollywood. It's your fault. You've been here 11 years. You've done nothing. Thank you, sir. Oh, I was glad to do that. Anytime. Good evening, Commissioners. My name is Rusty Joukowsky. I was going to talk about something further that was going to come up on the agenda, but being a former employee of the city, I can assure you that there is no budgetary requirement that I was ever asked to fulfill out to fix this. The Diamond Street project, you know where the stuff goes from spectacular? Diamond Street. You know what happens after every event? It gets shoved somewhere and we'll take care of it later. And then you guys come up here and say, we wanna spend all this money on all these parks and this is what it is. That is absolutely insane. We, were to, we would be told by managers, department managers who come to us and say, we need a budgetary number from you to do this. Not one time was there, we need to fix concrete, we need to fix this, we need to fix that. But I can assure you that there was money to paint every single water facility, every single water tank, thousands and thousands of gallons of paint and sprayers and high lifts and employees and moving stuff. And then you would talk about the cracks in the buildings how does that happen overnight? Mr. Sosa, I cannot thank you enough for bringing that up, and Ms. Bradford, you as well, but this has not been going on since he's been here. This has been going on 
for as long as I've been here since 1988. And I voted twice not to make this a city. And this is one of the reasons why. We watch our tax revenues go into Orange City, go into DeLand, and go into Sanford, because after every, every ball game that we did, where did we go afterwards? Orange City, get something to eat. You want to have an event, where do you go? Orange City. You want to go for a special night, where do you go? Sanford or DeLand? And you guys sit up here and talk about giving us money for another park? You say, oh, we won't walk 10 minutes to a park? I don't know one person that's going to walk 10 minutes anywhere unless they have a special dog. You go to Van Park, which I've been to, I couldn't tell you how many nights I've had popcorn and hot dogs for supper after working 12 hours a day and my boys playing baseball. And then they get a trophy, and where do we go? Somewhere else to have fun. So all we're asking is, is that you be good steward of our money and be responsible for that. And it's not fair that you guys think that we're that naive that we can't see those pictures. Only a couple of those pictures were, were based on somebody, a tenant being in there. I feel really bad about the boxing house. That's a wonderful house. You guys can't look at that and go, hey, there's a problem? I don't understand that at all. Most of that other stuff you saw, it's an employee that says, oh, just put it over there. Just stick it over there, we'll get it later. And how many times have you seen a budgetary requirement where your manager or your department head said, we want all of this money for maintenance? But they'll surely send you an emergency request to, move, to remove a tree that's blocking a lift station at a power line. I don't get it. So I appreciate your two stepping in and saying this is enough, and that's exactly what we agree on. I'm going to let my words from last night stand about what I wanted to talk about tonight. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's been 17 years that I haven't been in this building, and this is why I stayed away from it, because of all the stuff that's going on today. I represent the Aino Boxing Academy in the city of Daltona. To hard work and dedication, the coaches and I have managed to survive in that little building that was condemned a few weeks ago, but that was still our little building. We were able to do all the things we did for 17 years. We struggled to stay afloat, but somehow or another, we always managed to get there. We used to have a parks and recreation man called Steve Moore. He was my angel. He knew the, the issues that we had, and before he would put us out of the building, he'd throw us over his shoulder and carry us across the finish line. And that, to me, is leadership. Um, the condition of that building, we got it like that. 17 years ago, it had a leak in it with the promise that little by little, things are going to get fixed. Never happened. 2019, they shut us down again. And um, I, I believe at the time, Dr. Cooper was the city manager. We didn't get no notice, no phone call, no courtesy. No, nothing, just a big boot in the ass, get out of the building. I hate to put it in those words, but I got no love. I got no love for, for politicians and, 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 and city managers and none of that crap. Because they forget why they got elected to come into office, and they forget to do their job. Government, how they solve solutions, they throw money at everything. But that's a definition of insanity, because you continue doing the same thing over and over again, and nothing changes. That building is the way it is today, because the city never did nothing to help us keep it up. There was only one city commissioner before she was a commissioner that always helped us, which is Maritza. And it was always in our corner helping us to survive and throwing fun and fundraisers and all that stuff. Um, but I've never seen none of these people up there go to the gym. I've never seen none of these people up there stop by. Nobody from, no, nobody here. But they were quick to shut the doors. They allowed the building to go to crap. It's like that because in 2019, 
Dr. Cooper told us, stay in the building, we're gonna find another spot for you. Well, three years went by, nothing happened. They did it again. This time they put a handwritten note, gym closed, and they got so much pushback from the community that Monday morning, they put a condemned sticker on there. They should have done that 10 years ago, but it didn't happen. Um, it's never too late to make a wrong right. And the only thing I ever wanted, I was grateful for the space the city gave us. Till today, I am grateful. But it would have been so easy, knowing what was coming down a pipeline, to pick up the phone and say, hey, Ed, Come down, uh, come and see us. We need to talk. Uh, just a courtesy call. We've been servicing the city for 17 years, not 17 days or seven. Thank you, sir. 17 years. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That closes the public comment portion of the hearing regarding the inventory. May we vote, please? Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, Mr. Peters, can you please tell me what happened in 2019? I, I know you weren't the city manager, but you're still employed in the city. What happened in 2019, to your knowledge, as to why the repairs in the city weren't done for the for the box and gym at, gym at Campbell? Um, my understanding is that um, the Parks and Rec director wrote a letter in uh, 2019. Uh, informing the uh, boxing club that the building was going to be shut down because of major repairs that needed to be done. Um, the city manager at the time um, did a verbal override of that letter. Um, then shortly thereafter, um, Dr. Cooper came in and he continued the verbal override of the letter. And um, so when I was made aware of the issue, um, one of the curses of being a professional engineer is uh, uh, when I saw the bags uh, hanging from the rafter, I knew we had a structural problem. And uh, so I contacted the, uh, the building official and we determined that the building needed to be condemned. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. May we vote, please? And the motion passes seven to zero. Mr. Peters, you have your task ahead of you for an inventory and potential auction sale, et cetera. Next item is- Normally I would thank you, but um, it's gonna be a Herculean effort, so we will make it happen. Request for approval to award a contract to ABM. Next item on the agenda. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is continuation of the last item. Uh, back in, um, let's see here, February 7th of this year, we um, awarded a contract to um, ABM utilizing their contract with Boynton Beach, uh, so-called piggybacking. Um, that particular contract has all the provisions of the contract under engineering, consulting contracts of that nature. We do scopes of services. So what you have before you tonight is a scope of service from that contract in the amount of $49,250 for them to do an ADA compliance review, uh, overall deficiencies, inclusion of uh, the condemned buildings, um, and evaluate and prioritize for future corrective actions. Um, and in addition, their Boynton Beach contract allowed for energy savings review process that utilizes certain energy savings to help pay for the uh, improvements that need to occur. So we're recommending uh, approval of this contract for $49,250. Commissioner King. Madam Mayor, I'd like to make a motion. Move to approve the scope of service with ABM in the amount of $49,250. The acting city manager is authorized to correct senators uh, errors and the like. Second. Second. Properly moved by Commissioner King, seconded by Commissioner McCool. <clears throat> Any other comments, commissioners? Let's open the public comment portion of the hearing. Has anyone signed up for this item? This is the 
scope of service with ABM. Nobody signed up to speak on this item. That closes the public comment portion of the hearing. Mr. Peters, this is for the scoping of all the buildings, correct? Yes, ma'am. And what is the next process after the scoping? What is the next step in the process? Um, at the report outlines, uh, they you know one of the first things that we need to do is, and we've been talking about this since I came on board, is the need to do our ADA compliance from the 2010 law, U.S. law. Uh, we had a process in place early in the 2010, uh, but it was never followed through. Uh, we were made aware of this situation about a year ago, and uh, so this is an opportunity. For instance, um, just to give you an example, at Veterans Park, uh, we have sidewalks that uh, do not meet ADA requirements, and they need to be modified to meet those requirements. Um, and so they will do a full assessment from an ADA standpoint. They, while they're doing that work, they will do a full assessment of the buildings uh, as to structural integrity, uh, repair work that needs to occur, and they will recommend those, and then they will also put a priority list. Obviously, uh, a structural element that impacts public safety will get a very high priority as opposed to uh, painting a blemish on the wall. Uh, but they will help us put together that priority list, but uh, we will also utilize them uh, for putting together a uh, maintenance standards, uh, proper form for documentation going forward. So as Mr. Sosa said, so we have accountability going forward. Commissioner Bradford. Sorry, I'm just looking through this MDA. Under number one scope of work, it says develop a project which will fund the measures utilizing utility operational maintenance, capital cost avoidance savings and any other available funding sources, including local capital contributions and grants, funding and resources over a maximum period of 20 years. So we will be putting that, that'll start in the 2023 budget. I'm assuming we will have a fund that is starting for this. Is that what that's saying? Well, yes, ma'am. Um, to give you an example, we, um, uh, as we go through the process, we will be coming forward with a uh, budget amendment. Uh, we have a number of capital projects uh, that we will defer to you toward uh, the improvement that we need. Uh, some of those are ball field lights, and there is potential that the energy saving opportunity for those ball field lights, we may be able to use energy savings to do the work instead of paying um, straight out of the general fund. Uh, so those opportunities like that, for instance, here at City Hall, uh, we've had a history of some issues with our HVAC system by going to a more efficient APA system and the energy savings that result, uh, the cost to upgrade or fix that system could be funded through energy savings. So that's what that's about. Thank you. Okay, you seeing there's no more questions, may we vote please? And the motion passes seven to zero. Next item on the agenda is discussion regarding facility use agreements. Mr. Peters. Let me get my stuff ready here. Um, previously, I have sent the commission a Word document that outlines uh, 16 different facility use agreements that the city currently has or has recently expired. Um, this particular sheet included the name of the organization, uh, the facility they were using, the status of the contract of renewal, the terms of the original agreement, the rate in which they were being charged, um, and their certificate of insurance, the status of it. Um, so one of the first things that you notice when you go through this particular... Mr. Sheet. Peters, Mr. Yes. Peters, ladies and gentlemen, we've had a complaints up here that we cannot hear due to talking in the back area. Please refrain from speaking while the manager and others are speaking because it seems that some people cannot hear what's being said. Thank you. Mr. Peters? Sorry. Yes, ma'am. Um, there, what really jumps out at you with regard to this whole sheet and analysis is the rate. Uh, 
Uh, we have a number of facilities, the fees were waived. We have a number of organizations that are paying $5 per child or $5 per player. Um, and then we have uh, a rental rate of $120 a month. Um, we have 20% uh, of revenue, 20% of revenue, 20% of revenue, and then waived. Uh, so um, our fee structure needed to be looked at. So we contacted a number of uh, municipalities around Volusia County to find out how they were handling their facilities use agreement. Um, and then also we inquired with certain organizations that uh, use facilities around the country. Um, what was interesting is there seemed to be a, uh, a general consensus on an 80-20 split. 80% 80 go to the facility use user and 20% comes back to the city. Um, and like I said, several of our uh, facilities use agreements already have a 20% of, of revenue. Um, and so uh, we took further look at it. And um, you know, we have had some people that have expressed interest in doing tournaments uh, using a soccer field for years. They've been interested in it. Um, and then um, we have certain organizations that get a waiver and we look at it. Um, these are organizations that do something that provides a community benefit. Um, when I had the meeting with GAI to go over their survey, um, they made it reference to a pyramid. And it really stuck to me. The, the bottom of the pyramid is the community interest. One leg of the pyramid with level of skills. And then the other part was, do they, what percentage of the time do they tie up the facility? Um, and sh she was saying that in some parts of the country, for instance, if you're gonna tie up a facility completely, you should pay 100% of the cost involved in using that facility, one way or another. If you have something that provides a community interest, say it's a city-sponsored event or whatever, then the fees would be waived. On the opposite side, if you had a very gifted tennis player uh, who was doing private lessons on one of our tennis courts, uh, then they should pay a higher fee because of the skill set and the number of people involved, which is one out of 94,000 people. Um, so um, what we are recommending is that the city go to an 80-20 split, um, but we would make exception for uh, situations such as uh, organizations that do a community benefit. An example that I would use is one that we talked about last night, and that's the Boys and Girls Club. They get grants, they get other forms of funding to provide programs for the children um, who need that help, and the families of those children need that help. If the commission so desired, then that would be an example where the commission would make a decision that that particular organization provides a significant community benefit and the fees would be waived. Um, on the other hand, if you're having a major tournament, um, what we would propose, and it's a slight deviation from my report, and I apologize. What we would propose is that you either pay the field rental. Let's say you had a big soccer tournament. They're going to use six of our soccer fields at $50 an hour for eight hours a day on a three-day weekend. Uh, you're looking at something like $7,200 in income. However, uh, if they were fortunate enough to bring in 2,500 people paying $10 a piece, uh, we would get 20% of the 25,000, uh, which would be 5,000. Well, the field rental will be at a higher of the two, so it would be based on field rental. But for a tournament, we would do the rental for the facility or 20% of the revenue, whichever is greatest. So those are the three scenarios that we see uh, going forward. Um, 
the other thing that's very important here is, and um, a number of other municipalities do this, is that all the registrations and ticket sales go through the city. Uh, reason for this is um, a lot of these programs are based on the number of participants. For instance, uh, I'm just throwing a number, it's not an actual number, but you know, youth soccer, $100 a child, uh, it would be $80 to the youth soccer and $20 to the city. Um, but we need to know how many kids are involved. By, doing, by the city doing the registration, A, we use our communication resource to get the information out, which gives an opportunity to get more participants. So we got skin in the game by you know, putting the word out, you know, instead of having, say, 100 kids in the soccer program, if us getting the word out, we get 200 kids in the program, the city benefits by having the larger number. Um, but also, um, you know, the, the money situation is much cleaner. Um, and then if they have tournaments, uh, we would set up a process where they purchase the tickets online. Uh, we've had incidents in the last year where people have rented our field for various events. Um, and then they try to get the tickets out in the parking lot or at the gate or what have you. And it created a lot of turmoil in the community. And by us doing the ticket sales ourselves, um, it would take that element away. We would provide either online ticket purchase or they can come by to the Parks and Rec Department and make the purchase there. Uh, over time, it may be that there'll be an opportunity to expand that to other locations, uh, kind of like um, uh, uh, whatever these online uh, ticket sales places are over time. But initially, it would be at City Hall in person or online. And uh, we will need a little bit of time to make that happen. But that's our recommendation. Um, we would also like to have our city attorney redo the um, facility use agreement in light of that proposal. Um, there's some other things that need to be in it talking about, for instance, uh, we would take care of lining the fields. Um, if we would provide the referees or whatever, that would be part of the agreement. Um, whatever is unique to that thing, we would have, but the boilerplate of the agreement, uh, most specifically the part about insurance, uh, would be part of the um, agreement. We've been needing to update this agreement for some time, and we will be doing it as part of this process. Thank you, sir. Commissioners, do you have any comments? Any questions, any comments? Let's see, Commissioner McCool, Commissioner Sosa, and Vice Mayor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I want to understand the true cost because admittedly my child is um, 37 years old, okay? So um, I understand um, economics of today, so I really want to understand the true value, the true cost because I want sports to be affordable to everyone, right? So when we have um, down here, uh, Deltona, I'm just gonna, cause they're first on the, the, I understand Boys and Girls Club fee waived, right? Council on Aging fee waived, I get that. Okay, a, a Deltona Adult Soccer League, um, $5 per person. That's what we collect, right? To the city. The, we collect $5 per person to the city with Deltona Adult Soccer League, correct? That is correct. So how do we parlay that $5? What does it cost a soccer player to play? And I'm trying to understand the economics of how it is we, the, the revenue at $5 per person for uh, manpower, uh, there has to be other factors here, right, that we are receiving other money. And I understand that we're collectively throughout the city, but I'm trying to really understand how we're affording to operate our our fields. I'm not being facetious. I'm being for real that I'm trying to understand no, uh, the economics of this. I appreciate what you're saying. Um, just to put it in perspective, the facilities use agreement that we have in place right now resulted in a total revenue of $76,000 to the city last year. 
Okay, stop. $76,000 revenue, city of 100000 $76,000 is what we collected, right? That's and I'm my going, understanding. Okay. And paying for our parks and rec, that portion where we talked about what the budget was, that we budget that for parks and rec. Parks and rec should be affordable for everybody. I want to keep reiterating that. We owe that to our residents. We owe that to our kids. We owe that to your tax money. So I'm getting that. I'm trying to understand the economics. So $75,000 plus a budget amount, that's what we have to spend on our parks, correct? Well, when we do the budget, we anticipate the revenue under the revenue side of the budget. And then we have the expenditure side of the budget. So the 76,000 is rolled into the uh, cost to maintain the facility. Okay. So this is the true cost here. When it's five dollars, that's what we're getting as far as revenue. Uh, and what is the revenue to expenditure ratio? Pardon what me? is the revenue to expenditure ratio at Parks and Rec right now? It it is. Uh, I would just say that that is a deplorable number. Um, it, it's not revenue neutral. I'm sure. Nowhere near. No, uh, no. I'm really. I'm just trying to right put this out here. It's not. Again, part of our tax money goes to paying for this what the residents pay for. I'm just trying to figure out what that revenue to expenditure is, right, in making my decision when we're talking about these fees and these facility use agreements. Ma'am, if I can just give you an example. Um, using the national standard, Dewey Boxer, I believe, is about 60 acres. Uh, using national standards, we would have three full-time employees involved with the maintenance of Dewey Boxer Park. Um, if you took those people with benefits and everything, uh, you're in the ballpark of 50, 55,000 in employees. So that's 150, 165,000 just for people. The mowers are not cheap mowers. Uh, they're real mowers. They're about 150, 160,000 apiece um, in that ballpark. We replace them on about a five, six year cycle. So let me make my math easy. Five years into 150, that's 30,000 a year. So now you're approaching 180. You got the chemicals, you got replacement parts. So I would say it'd be accurate to say that just the maintenance of Dewey Boxer Park is on the order of 200 to 250,000 a year. And we have 76,000 for the total city. Yeah, and I'm trying to I'm trying to get that whole picture when I'm asking. So, um, as much as we talk about this and we talk about when we get to budget season, right? I understand that, and I'm trying to get both sides, of, or I should say, three sides of the coin here, right? Because we're making decisions on facility agreements, which needs to be favorable to the residents, right? And it also needs to be favorable to the city when we talk about operating the city as a business, right? That's why I'm trying to get everyone's input on this. Resident input, right? City manager input, the financial input on this. Because it's a, that's, you know what I mean? Your, your utilities alone last year were $221,200 for park and rec. That was what was budgeted for utilities. Just utilities. So we're over now at four hundred twenty thousand dollars, right? No, no, that's all. The, all the yeah, parks. No, that, but that's all the parks. That's collective in the budget. That's not Dewey just. But I know Dewey has a high utility bill with the lights and everything. Yeah, and that's water. all I'm trying to do is get that lay and get get that understanding as we're talking here. So, and, and I know that we are being. Have we been? I haven't seen. I didn't see it in my package, and I'm sure that we will discuss. But I'm just trying to get that. Expenditure to revenue distribution a little more favorable, right? I understand that we depend on those tax dollars. Yes, your tax dollars do pay for that part, but we also have a budget to follow. And I'm just trying to understand all those components, right, to budget it out favorably for everyone. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner Sosa. About, in all the different programs we have, about how many participants do we have? Between 
Uh, on average, I mean, how many are we looking at for all the different activities, adult soccer, youth soccer, West Volusia baseball, uh, the football, the, the football, the Panthers? Probably a little over 1,000 right now. Yeah, somewhere in that range, between 1,000 and 1,500 right now. Yeah. 1,000 and and that's per season? Per season. Yeah. Okay. Now, my question is, when you have 1,000 to 1,500 per season, and there's usually two seasons per year, how many staff members do you think it's going to take to be able to sign up all these participants? Participants, registration software, everything can be, most things can be done online, uh, but you do have your typical office staff that can take in-person registrations. Uh, you have uh, the individuals that you, your individual facilities that can do in-person registrations. So the personnel for that is already in place. So you already have the staff to be able to do this? Yes. All right. Um, so you already got the equipment in order to it's do this? Sosa. All right. Let me, let me explain that a little bit. Um, right now, our staff members, and, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, so please don't take it that way. Our staff members are chasing the payments. So we spend as much money chasing payments, you know, receiving the payments and all that from different people, logging it in, doing the invoices and all that. And so we would be shifting their function to registration instead of what they're currently doing. That's why we're able to do it with the current staff. Okay. So basically when you do the signups, you're looking at taking 100% of the registration fees and then giving a cut 80% to each of the teams. And when, when would you anticipate about giving that cut? At the, after registration or at the end of the season? Uh, most of the organizations around it do it at registration. At registration. All right, thank you. Commissioner, or I'm sorry, Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Mr. Peters, can you explain to me how um, or what are the requirements to have your fees waived when using property from the city? I knew this was going to be asked. Um, what I would propose to do is to come back with the, to the commission with a policy on uh, what types of program we would consider waiving and then getting the commission to agree to those policies. Um, you know, part of the process tonight is we, I'm sure, going to receive public comments, uh, but um, I think it's something, you know, it started last night with the dialogue about a car show. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to have a serious dialogue on what we consider to be community events or community programs so that we know uh, what we would be, con what we would consider for waiver because staff needs that direction also. And uh, it would be a good opportunity to have a, uh, a vibrant conversation on what we consider to be community um, type event. Obviously, something like you know, Carnawin or Fourth of July or something like that is certainly a uh, community event. However, there are other revenue opportunities, such as if we had vendors come in they would sign an agreement that we would get a percentage of their revenues in lieu of uh, the event having to pay for the, the fees. So that's the thought. Well, the example you're giving me, July, it's a city event. It's an event put on by the city. My question is, how um, do you come to waiving fees for an organization to use city property? There are no procedures, policies right now? Uh, Vice who, Mayor, who are you? Decides, who decides to waive fees for an organization using city property, a park or? You do. Um, we do. Yes, you do. Wow, we do. Let, let's, let's clarify. Vice Mayor, are you asking for an entity for using a city building, or are you talking about a policy and procedure you, for one special event? 
No, I'm, use, I'm, re, I'm referring to using an entity for an organization to be waived the fees. So okay. we have soccer, the youth groups, we have the soccer players, we have all these organizations that are paying $5 per person to use our parks, probably another additional fee. But we have some organizations that their fees are waived. So I just want to know how, who decided that? Because we didn't. You know, sir, Madam Mayor. Yes, no, no comments from the public, please. I'm sorry. Um, what? What, when you have public comment, anyone who signed up can speak. Yeah, public comment is, so basically, when you look at, I can speak for the $5 per person. That was a commission policy that was set and it was passed by, I believe, resolution, maybe yes, by ordinance or resolution, it was passed with a tiered increasing schedule. It was passed by the commission. I apologize, I don't have the paperwork right here. And it was $5, a, it was supposed to be $5 a kid a year, then to go up to $10, then to go up to $20. Do you have that by any chance, Stacy? No, but anyway, Mr. Peters, do you have a copy of that? I do not have it in front of me. Well, one way or the other, it was not followed. The commission approved it because I can tell you right here when I asked for that information in 2020, I asked for the financials for multiple organizations that use Dewey Boster and what I was given were fiscal year 16 and 17. One group paid 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. That was you, Charlie. The other ones paid 17 and 18. One paid only in fiscal year 18. And then Bethune-Cookman paid fiscal year 16. That was the only year they were there. My comment was this was incomplete because I had asked for the total funding for groups that used Dewey Boster. So come to find out at that time, city manager, unbeknownst to the commission, said, okay, only one year. So some of these entities paid one year, some of these paid two years, but none of this was collected, aside from Daltona Adult Soccer, after fiscal year 18. Twice a year. Yeah, you, I mean, you're here, whatever, you paid every year. So we have entities that were paying their $5 a kid for two years, one, one group only paid for one year, fiscal year 18, and none of this was ever brought forth to the commission or told to us that these organizations were not being charged. Not only that, the tiered level of increasing from $5 a kid to $10 a kid to $20 a kid was also never followed, was also never followed by management, by management. So when you talk about what was done, when you start looking back as a commissioner and ask for financials and ask for information, and then you come to find out that city policies and procedures were not followed and were just done internally, here we are. I asked for this information in July 10th, 2020, and to this date, we still haven't followed the ordinance and increased the tiers. We haven't done it haven't done it. So, Mr. Peters, you have a huge task ahead of you. So that's all I can speak for, Vice Mayor, for the $5. These other ones, I know that the Boys and Girls Club and, and other entities receive money through CDBG, mm -hmm. but the others should have all come to the commission for the fees to be waived. And if they didn't, were they done internally without with bypassing the commission, because more and more we're finding that out. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, thank you, that was, you answered my question. Commissioner McCool. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. I wanted to, that's where I was trying to visit also, is the ones that were waived. Deltona Youth Soccer Concession waived. Do we know who waived that? I just want, do we have four, right? We waived. Deltona Youth Soccer Concession was waived. Fees were waived. Healthy Start Coalition waived. Does that benefit the community? Do I profit from that? Does anyone profit from Healthy Starts? No, it's community benefit, period. The next one that has waived on this side, uh, Deltona Strong, which is what? The community gardens. Community gardens, does anyone profit from that? Does anyone hear from Deltona Community Gardens? Does anyone profit from that? Has anyone put money into that? Has the city put money into that? Can I ask that, Mr. Peters? I mean, we're getting to the root of things. I want to bring this out. So community gardens, has anyone but the community benefited from community gardens? I, I don't think so. So the fee waived there. Boys and Girls Club, we talked about that. Benefit to the community. What do we profit from that? No one profits from that. The community benefits from that. Fee waived. Council on Aging, fee waived. I'm not seeing a, a problem here, but I agree that we need to have... Um, we need to have stuff, you know, policy and procedure put but, in place for that. So I, I speaking and, it, and in all uh, transparency, I'm a member of Deltona Strong, which takes care of the community gardens. And I remember it being okayed. I don't think that we would have occupied that space down at Van Park, but it, and because commission has been out there to events. We were out there for the butterfly gardens. So as far as the fee being waived for that, I can only speak to that. But I just wanted to clarify that in case there was a question about, you know, anything about that. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Bradford? No. Let's, no. Okay. Um, so, commissioners, you have um, what Mr. Peters proposed to you in terms of discussing these facility use agreements. Um, Madam Mayor, yes. if I can make a suggestion, uh, rather than voting on anything tonight, I would suggest that you all have consensus on what we said. We will do a uh, resolution to bring it back to you at another meeting so you know precisely what you're voting on, because I'm not even sure I can remember what I said. But, um, you know, I think it's important that we have a resolution um, that, you know, you all can consider. What I'm looking for tonight is consensus on the idea of, of doing the 80-20 split, the city taking over the registration and ticket sales, and the city putting together a policy, staff putting together a policy with regard to what organization would have their fees waived. And new contracts. And new contracts. And a new uh, facilities use contract. So you'll have three separate things to vote on at a later date. At a later date. Yes, so what do you need from us this evening before we? I need you all to give me consensus if that's the direction you want to go. Um, Commissioner Sosa. You know, just looking at all these contracts, most of them have expired or getting ready to expire. Are you keeping the current rate in place until the new agreement's put in? Uh, sir, we, uh, we're in the middle of an RFP for um, the youth soccer program, we had two bidders. Um, we are still in the midst of uh, reviewing them and making a decision. Uh, the Deltona Youth Soccer um, asked that they be allowed to continue the program this, this season. So what we did is we told them that they could rent the fields directly because there was no basis for the $5 fee because there was no agreement. Uh, they did that. I believe they went four weeks paying the, the fee the, for the fields, uh, which was a substantial amount of money. They came to me and requested that they be allowed to go on a per trial basis for the balance of the season, um, being put in a difficult position of basically agreeing to it or telling them they have to shut the season down. I was not going to be the city manager that going to shut the season down, so I made a unilateral decision to um, let them continue the balance of the year on a per child basis. Uh, but the amount of fees that we receive for this will receive for this season exceeds the revenue that we would have gotten in three total years under the old plan. 
So that's the only exception that we've done so far. I had planned to tell you all that um, after we dealt with this. Okay. What about for all the other leagues? Because I've noticed, like with the Deltona adult soccer, you're doing a month to month right now for three years. But we have some other, like Deltona Little League. Uh, you got uh, the concession stand for the Little League. Uh, you got the the Panthers football. Are you going to do the same thing? Do a month to month with them, or how how are you doing that? I will allow Mr. Reckley to answer that question since they're the ones been handling. Well, they're expired. So uh, it's in transition. I did put out at one point to try to increase the fees, but in some seasons it's the middle of the season, so it's for the start of the season. So it's hard to make that adjustment after the registrations. Um, so it will, would be my recommendation if the season is starting to keep on the same track until something new is negotiated or the commission agrees to go in a certain process uh, moving forward. So, so basically, we're going to do a month-to-month -month or a by-season until we get something in place. If there's no contract, that would be the case, unless in individuals came upon uh, to meet with the city manager again and staff to negotiate something differently, such as we did with soccer. All right. Thank you. Commissioner McCool? And, and I might have blacked out for a moment, but I just want to make sure that the, the other the other participants, people that are paying 20 percent, um, the karate club, are theirs are is, are they staying the same right now until we do this transition? Because I, I heard, okay, well I only heard the soccer league and stuff like that. I just want to make sure that it was everybody was staying the same for right now until these are ironed out. Yes. I heard the soccer league baseball. I get that, but we have if other they, participants. If they have a current agreement in place, we will continue with the current agreement. What if um, they don't? When the agreement expires, we hopefully will have a new process in place, and they will come under that new process. But And if I could, because the contracts come to me most of the time, we have a few that are in the queue uh, waiting for this meeting tonight. Um, so, you know, otherwise, the ones that are not in the queue right now and have current contracts, you know, depending on how the city manager wants to do it, we, I would develop a new agreement. We want to use more of, so they're all basically the same and mm -hmm. just certain provisions will change. Um, and we'll just start putting a new form into the rotation. Okay. Um, Ms. Nicole, what I would recommend to uh, the city attorney is if we have somebody that's in the queue, because obviously I'm asking you all for consensus tonight. So a new contract would have a two-part provision. The first part would be until we adopt a new fee schedule, they will stay on the current fee schedule they're on. And that's Upon what... Upon approval of the new fee schedule, they would go to that fee and, schedule. Okay. Perfect, because I don't want somebody standing. I know that we have a lot of anxious participants, and I'm trying to help them because change is inevitable, right? But preparing them for change is a good thing in, in, in assuring them that their if their investments are protected until then, right, will bring peace of mind that you're taking care of until we do the facility, new facility use agreements and fee structures. That's That's all I'm trying to say. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just want to make sure that, because I heard rumors of people saying that we were um, asking all the uh, renters of city um, facilities to leave. And I just want to make sure that this is not true, that we are not asking them to leave. It's just that there is a difference changing in the um, agreements. Am I correct? I think that I have two or three that are in the queue. And based on what John has just said, tomorrow, you know, we'll pull those and look at them. And if they comply with what he has just said, we'll just put a provision in there on the fee schedule and can move them. But I have no contracts where I've been told to stop them or they must go or any of those kinds of things. Okay, so they, they continue to stay where they are 
of the one, I just don't have the names of the ones okay. that are in the queue, but you know, wh whichever ones are wait, they're waiting for an approval, um, we'll get it out tomorrow. Thank you. Commissioner Bradford. Just a quick question. This could be a stupid question. So I was the Veterans Memorial Park, wasn't there a agreement on that one that I seen on the email you sent? Because I'm not first, I don't know if it's just missing because like my page three is blank. So I don't know if I'm supposed to have two pages or three pages, but um, don't we run out the Veterans Memorial as well? Which one are you talking about? The Veterans Museum. The Veterans Museum. Is um, that not rented out as well? I here. thought I had seen before we had something received that there was a contract out on that one as well. But on this one, I don't have it now. But on one that we received last week or week before that, I had one that had the, uh, the Veterans Museum on there and that it was waiting on a contract. So I'm just wondering why it's not on this one now. Okay, yeah, I'm just curious because my page three is blank and I know it was on the last one, but it's not on this one. Thank you. Okay. We'll check on. Before we move to public comment, Mr. Peters, you need consensus on? Yes, ma'am. What I would like a consensus for uh, the general concept of the fee structure put into a resolution a separate item for a new uh, facilities use contract and then a separate policy uh, resolution regarding how we would consider what fees can be waived. There'll be three separate items and if I can just get consensus on those three. Would you um, like that in the form of a motion or just verbal consensus? Verbal consensus will work. Okay, Commissioner King? Yes. Commissioner McCool? Yes. Commissioner Ramos? Yes. Vice Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Bradford? Yes. Commissioner Sosa? Okay, and myself, yes. So you have consensus on those items. Thank you very much. Now are we good to go to public comment? Yes. Rusty Gaskowski? David Bernklau? Mr. Abrams, Jason Holenbach. Okay, Mr. Gaskowski first. Good evening again, commissioners. Um, I, I, sitting back here and it just seems so heartless at, at what you're saying, you cannot convince me for one second that the director of public works doesn't look at a budget and say, we have this much coming in to play, this is what we're gonna do, this is our anticipated, whatever it is, the events we're gonna have, and then you guys can't manage that through the budget that you have, it would cost me an extra $150 a month on the tier schedule that you're talking about to have my three kids in one event. You talking about this having the field rented out for three days and all these events coming in here, where are they gonna stay? Say Orlando City Soccer wants to come up here and throw a three day event, who's gonna stay here? Who's gonna eat here? Who's gonna participate here? You guys have the wrong mindset. We're the ones that you should be trying to convince why you're in that seat. Not we need to raise your money so much that you can't do it. If you raised up that price on the tier scale that you're talking about, I could not participate. Plus the two years of COVID that killed the entire world. I don't understand the mentality. It seems like Mr. Sosa is the only one that has a basic knowledge, more than a basic knowledge of how the world actually works. And you guys come up here and pretend, I guess, that you don't know or you don't care. You don't say anything. He's the only one. I wish you were my commissioner. I'm sorry. And you know what's my fault that I don't participate? I wish I was more like the gentleman in the back that's here giving you guys a hard time and keeping your feet to the fire. But that's exactly what I'm going to do now. Because you have to earn what you have. And being in martial arts, you earn your belt. You have to fight for your belt. You have to work for your belt. And now you wanna come in here and change the tier structure and do all this, and it's like the heart just went away. Oh, but let's build a park and it'll make everything fine. It's only 10 minutes walk down the road. I don't understand it. 
I suggest that you keep whatever's in place is in place. Well, I have not heard one person say, Mike, you can stay where you are, and the very second you decide you don't want to do anymore, the new user agreement takes place. That's hard. That has some brains in it that says, we care about Mike Abrams and his students and what he's trying to do. He's not out here for profit. He works a full-time job in South Orlando as a mechanic at night just so he can teach during the day and pay 25 bucks and charge 25 bucks per student. And he only charges the extra five bucks because you guys said there's a rent increase. And that was a grumbling in and of itself. So I'm suggesting to you is that you step back and you say, okay, look, there's a better way to have a little heart to the people that make this, this community. I'm almost regretting that I'm still here since 1988 because I never anticipated this and it's my fault for not being an active member of this community in this body. But I guarantee you that I am from now on. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> David Burnclaw, please. He's gone. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Abrams? Hello, Madam Mayor and Commissioners. Um, I, I just want, you know, this is the second night I've, I've been here and waiting to find out a, a decision on what, where my program is lying here. Um, it doesn't sound like we have a decision yet of where my program is going to be. Um, according to this uh, sheet here that we were reading uh, about all the fees that were waived and everything, um, my contract in parentheses here says it doesn't expire to 2023. December 2023, but it also says underneath renewal out for signatures. So somebody please explain what that means. So I understand that. Do I have a viable contract? Yes, sir, you do. Okay, so and, what, and, what? And we'll get it taken care of tomorrow. Okay, so, so the, the I'm a signature. Oh, you're the signature. <laughs> well, I'm not the only signature. Okay. Because every, every year I have to put out a packet with all the students and all the I insurances understand. and all that kind yeah. of stuff to make sure that I'm in compliance. Yes. One of the other things I wanted to bring up, I still have time, good. One of the other things I wanted to bring up is that I know all those parks that you were showing, how deplorable they were, but sometimes you ought to show some positive stuff too. The West Crail Park, if you go in that meeting room and you go in the gym, which you just mm -hmm. did the, all the insulation and everything, looks pristine, okay? So when I use the, utilize the room, if I walk in there and the floor is not clean enough to put my mats down, because I put mats down every session, I don't run over to the park and recreation director or the manager or the guy that's running the place. I bring out the mop bucket that I supply my own soap with and mop the floor. Put the fans out, my own fans, let them dry, and then I put the mats down. I take care of that building just like it's my own building, just like it's mine, okay? And I've all, I told you last night I did the same thing. I've offered, I've asked, give me the paint. I've asked Mr. Manning over there, give me the paint, or I'll buy the paint. I have people who are gonna make donations. I'll paint the trim, the color that's, that's in there now, and paint the walls. Fix any of the little spots on the drywall that might be damaged, or from when people put have birthday parties, they put tape on there and they rip off the paint after that, you know, because they hang their banners up and everything. I'll do that. My, my students will do that. We've all volunteered to do that in this program because we care about what we use. We care about the building. We're very appreciative of a, being allowed to utilize this building for this program. We're very appreciative. That's why we do what we do there. We take care of it. We, we always host, when we host the, when a student comes in or a, protect, a parent comes in and says to us, uh, how come your rates are so cheap? Well, I have an agreement with the city to keep my rates down because I want to supply benefit for the community. That's why I do what I do. And I will continue to do that. I've done that for 24 years and I'll do it for 24 if I still am alive by then. I don't know. But what I'm saying to you is that I, you all benefit by me utilizing that room. I take care of that room, okay? I try to impress upon that to the city manager and also the park and recreation director and his assistant. I take care of that room just like it's my own. 
because I'm appreciative of, of you all allowing me to utilize that room. That's all I have to say. And thank you for getting that contract back to me. Thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate you. your time. Jason Holenbach, then Richard Bellick, then Charles Vance, then Susan Peer. Jason Holenbach, please. Good evening, everybody. I'm here to speak on behalf of Deltonia Soccer Club. Uh, we were notified on November 2nd that the city would not be renewing our field use agreement. <clears throat> we were never informed as to why this would be. Um, in the letter sent from the city, uh, we were told that it had been determined that this current agreement with Deltona Youth Soccer Club was not sufficient to meet the level of service and that the city of Deltona would be seeking a request for proposal from all interested parties to provide a comprehensive youth soccer program for ages 4 to 18 that focused on multiple components to include instructional, recreational, and travel programs. Well, since our club was inducted in 1981, DYSC has provided a comprehensive youth soccer program for ages 4 through 18 that focuses on multiple components to include instructional, recreational, and travel programs. Furthermore, we've been providing these services and programs at Dewey since the opening of Dewey. Um, if you refer to the contract log under Section 7, you'll see that DYSC is the only club that has an RFP out for soccer programming that was sent out for. If, was, if there was something more that the city needed um, from the club, I would expect the city to communicate those needs and allow Deltona Youth Soccer Club to provide the requested services. I believe uh, communication can resolve months of uncertainty in a couple minutes. We can talk about it, we can figure it out. Um, since the field use agreement was not renewed, we were given the option of renting the soccer fields, if they were available, at the current rates of $50 per hour per field without lights and $75 per hour per field with lights. Deltona Youth Soccer Club is a nonprofit youth soccer club that operates on a fiscal budget. Um, our soccer year starts in August and it ends in May. So the, uh, the field use agreement stopped right in the middle of our season when we're already in the middle of a fiscal budget. <clears throat> um, when we finalized our budget using the past field use agreement for our 2021-2022 year at $5 per player per season or $10 per year, um, the fee schedule that we had been working with for a number of years like I said, the change occurred in the middle of our fiscal cycle, uh, where at the time we had around 160 players that were registered from the fall season that continue through the spring season. Uh, since we didn't have a field use agreement, DYSC did not promote the spring season because we were uncertain of the future. Um, this did in fact hurt our registration numbers. We had to make a lot of tough decisions and we decided to move forward and rent the fields as long as we could to have a spring season for the community's children and not cut off their soccer season in the middle of the year. I feel like we're missing something. Um, we hope the council can help us rectify this that the club members and the kids will have some predictability for the next season. Uh, Deltona Youth Soccer Club has never been unsure of its future, but it kind of is now. Um, I would ask that the council treat all youth sport clubs fairly and equally as the goal of these clubs is to provide opportunities for youth and not make a profit. And that's the way, again, that we can keep everything low, keep these kids happy, and provide a great service for the community. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Richard Bellick, please. I wonder where all this money that's collected goes. Uh, now, let me get this straight, Heidi. You've been here 11 years. Ms. Bradford has been here five, a little over five. Mr. What's his name over there, Ramos, he's been here at least five, right? All these things none of you has ever heard of before till tonight, come on. Now, this money that's collected, how does these people here, how do they know where that money goes? You see what they've seen up there? The whole city's a wreck. You got a center, you lose over a million dollars a year, okay? Over a million. It's going to cost a couple of million to get this park straightened out. Then nobody's going to do it for nothing. What is it? Pass the buck here, pass the buck there. Get angry when somebody brings something up to you. Get angry. Oh, oh, oh. Come on. Let's, let's be fair here. 11 years, all right? A Senate that loses over a million dollars a year. 
Look at the destruction we've seen on that film. If I was you, I'd be ashamed to say I was here 11 years, but for you, I guess it just don't matter. I mean, you know, you're, you're like an institution here. It's like you were born up there. But anyway, these fees that are waived, with all that money that flies out the window, what the hell you want to talk about a $5 fee that's being waived? Come on, how much could it actually be? Now, I heard Mr. Peters here, you're saying that you gave him a, a, a phenomenal structure to solve. Give me his $170,000 a year, I'll solve it for you. Come on. People are, people are getting paid here. You're getting paid to ruin the city. That's what it looks like. I mean, don't ask me, ask these people. I mean, you know, me, I'm a windbag. I don't know what I'm talking about. That's what it looks like. You're getting paid to ruin a city. You won't have an audit. You won't have a Senate audit where, where, where people could see where this money goes. Because with all this money that's passing hand and goes out the windows, <laughs> Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer ain't getting it. I mean, come on, let's be real. Now, when we come here, Heidi, every meeting, you're angry. You get angry. Blah, 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 blah. You've been collecting a check for 11 years. Who are you kidding? you got nothing to be angry about. Come on. You seen what you've seen tonight? I'm going to keep drumming on it. This city's a disaster. you got a Senate. You pay no attention to it. But a million dollars of the taxpayer, over a million dollars of the taxpayer's money goes out the window every year. For what? You heard the woman up here in the beginning say she didn't want to have a meeting in the summer because it's too hot, right? How are these kids going to go play in, P in these parks in the summer when it's that hot? How long can they play? You got a center up there that's sitting empty all the time that you're losing money on that these people are paying for, not you, them. Make it something for these kids. You, you, your boxing ring? Put a boxing ring up there. What's the problem? You're not going to bother the seniors, but you'll let it sit empty, and you'll never bring it up and never talk about it. I mean, come on, a million dollars? In today's, a million dollars seems to be a lot of money to some people. Evidently, to use it, don't. And like I said, 11 years, five years with Bradford, five years with Ramos, all these things all of a sudden, it's like a jack-in-the-box. They just popped up. Nobody ever seen it before. Nobody ever seen it. Nobody ever heard of it. Nobody ever witnessed it. Come on, people have been complaining about these dumps for years. Stop it. Thank you, sir. Charles Vance, please. Hmm? Everybody knows me as Charlie Vance. <laughs> I'm the president of the Adult Soccer League. I've been doing it for 22 years since we became a city and the first mayor decided we need a soccer park because there were no full-size soccer fields in Deltona. And a lot of people came to me and said, we need an adult program too. So I started an adult program at $45. In 22 years, it's only gone up to 65. And part of that, because you guys kicked in another $5 fee on everybody that participated when we thought our taxes was paying for the park for us to go use it at our leisure. The same as a youth soccer club. Different arrangements, but that was built for them too. And they used to have five, 600 kids. And I even put a proposal before you that I could do some kids during the summer to give them more of something to do, just like whoever you're paying that first lady for said we need more stuff for kids during the summer. And it was going to be the same price as the adults. I charged $65 cash or check, 70 if you use a credit card, because that got to pay the credit card charges. And you want to know where the money goes? I give everybody a $15 shirt. I pay about between seven and ten grand for referees for a season. And of course the shirts are like fifteen bucks a piece. So if you buy four hundred shirts, do the math, you're up to four or five grand. Administrative fees, insurance, two grand a year, which will be more because everything's going up in the whole economy. 
And now that everything's going up, you guys got to jump in there too. I said, let's redo the schedule and let the city collect the money. You just said earlier, I didn't understand, you had trouble collecting the money, but now you want to go full time collecting the money that you can't get now. I didn't understand that part because people that owe you, you're not getting that. And how are you going to get it when they come register? I wouldn't agree with that 2080 split and everything unless you let me collect the money and then I'll give you 20. Okay? But the way you were saying it, I wouldn't know how to budget the damn thing because I wouldn't know how many people are signing up. My fee is based on minimum amount of people come. We run a six aside league, 10 people on a team. If I only have six people show up for the team, I only charge six people. I don't charge the whole team 650 bucks, only the ones that showed up. So I may have a team with just six people on it, which half the time, half the teams I have only have six or seven people. So I don't even, I have to budget on the minimum amount of people to show up. And that's how my budget is ran. And if I didn't have to pay $5, it'd be 60. Because we're supposed to be given a community service, just like Mike was saying. That's what I do, is doing a community service. I'm sorry, I'm retired three times already. I needed something to do. So I do soccer twice a year. But if we go with this split and you collect the money, the fee's gonna have to go up to 100 bucks, like the little kids in soccer have to pay to start off, the four and five year olds because they have higher fees. Kids cost more insurance too. And then you gotta run background checks on everybody, which is if I was allowed to do high school level soccer here in the summer, I gotta do background checks. Thank on. you, sir. Susan. Thanks, Charlie, your time's up, sorry. Appreciate it. Susan Peer, please. Stop. You can talk to the manager. Thank you. Well, I hope you didn't think I was yelling, not to talk loud anyway. <laughs> Madam Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Commissioners, City Manager, I was here last night, and I'm sure you remember, and I sp spoke about um, the Okinawa Martial Arts Program previously. Um, I got some bullet points. It's not as organized, because I didn't, I was taking notes on the fly, so please bear with me. Um, one of the points I'm seeing in the paper that I have here, it was that in cases where the need for the program can be documented, the city would sponsor the program with the instructor working under the city on an hourly basis. I would hope that that did not apply to our program, um, unless you've actually studied martial arts, have been a part of that kind of program. Martial arts instructors are not interchangeable people. Um, people go into a program because it works for them and because they have something that to offer. And it's, it's usually a very specific, um, uh, it could be anything from the, the style that they're doing to their, their manner of, of, of uh, implementing it to any one of a number of things. But I sincerely would hope that that would not be something that would, would apply to us because that's not going to keep us as students for sure. I don't know what you would plan on doing that way, but I don't know what that's all about. All about but that's, I, I, I would certainly hope that would not the case. Um, as it was stated, if the government takes over these businesses, it's going to be much more more expensive for the government. The residents pay taxes for these facilities. They don't, they're not paying taxes for them just to pay more and more and more to use them. In the case of the karate program, many of the participants who are most in need are unable, not necessarily able to pay higher fees. No one's benefiting financially from this program. This is not, a, you know, I think technically it's a for-profit program. There's not a profit going on here because the money, as, as Mr. Abrams uh, stated last night, it goes directly back into these students, to the students that can't afford equipment. There's sparring gear that's expensive. There are weapons that are expensive. You know, kids, that are, families that have got multiple children in this program, you know, we got one family that's got three teenage boys in there. They can't afford, you know, he just went out and bought their size sparring equipment so that they could spar and not have to pay for the equipment because that would be too much of an onus on the parents to have to deal with that kind of thing. You know, this is the kind of program we have. Um, let's see. 
I think turning city buildings into revenue generators, and I just, it doesn't sound right. Now I'm not, obviously, I don't do what you guys do, but it, it just doesn't sound right to me. The primary purpose, as far as I'm concerned, should be for the city and its inhabitants. That's what these buildings and that's what these facilities are for. Um, private business, businesses are just that. They're private businesses. They are for profit. The city should be providing affordable alternatives. People can't afford the significant cost increases that you're asking for. Uh, Mr. Peter stated in, back in uh, 2000 how bad the economy was. I don't know if any of you watch TV. It ain't too great right now, and I think if we look into the future right now, it's not looking too great. They're, they're talking about all kinds of, they're talking food shortages, they're talking all kinds of things. This is not the time to start cutting programs and increasing fees for these programs. We need these more than ever right now, more than in my entire lifetime. I'm 60 this year, more than my entire lifetime. We need these programs now. People are stressed, people need something to do, their kids need something to do. The things that kids have been through in the last two years is I've never seen it in my life. And, and why would you take something away from them that's helping them? Um, I think historical poor management should not cost us programs. Um, Madam Vice Mayor had a valid point. There are options to make before just general upheaval and raising rates. I think uh, rent, renting a facility shouldn't make the rental responsible for major maintenance of the place. Um, minor maintenance, sure, you know, you, you would negotiate those in the FUAs, but I don't, I don't think you make major fee increases to make up for past poor judgment. Um, I don't know what's going on over here, but I just think that it, it's doing the wrong thing to take it away from these kids and to take it away from us. It's the wrong time, and I think there's other things to do, and there's more efficient ways to do it, and I, I wish that you would. Thank you, ma'am. John Kielis, you. please. Hello there. Um, my grandson is a participant in uh, Sensei Mike's karate program. Uh, he's, a, he's been an asset and a benefit to the community. Um, Can you start the timer, please? With, and I'm oh, sorry, sir. Can you I, pull your mic a, a little closer? Thank sorry. you. Yes. So, like I said, my grandson's a participant in the karate program. Uh, he's been in it for five years. He's entered into several tournaments, which he would not be able to do if it wasn't for Mike, Sensei Mike. Um, I have two other grandchildren that will be going into the program, and to raise the rates, we wouldn't be able to do that. So, um, basically, I, um, I would say to maintain the status quo, keep him in place. He's a great asset to the community, and he instills these values you have on the wall uh, to the kids. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Jackie Torno, then. Ed Alvarado, then Kelly LePac, then Gregory Holder. Jackie Tor now, please. Not here. Ed Alvarado, please. I think he left. Kelly LePac, please. Hi, thank you. I am uh, with the Deltona Panthers Youth uh, tackle football and cheerleading association. Um, I am the treasurer, so they sent me here to kind of give my input. Um, you asked questions earlier about how many kids and how much it costs. We have normally, um, because of COVID, our numbers have been down, but we're hoping this year to have 180 plus boys and girls out on the fields with us. Um, over 50% of those kids are on some form of every sports scholarship. I track down, I work payment plans. We want every child that comes out to register to be able to play. We are an all volunteer, nonprofit organization. I can't tell you how many hours goes into running a large organization like this. And to see the fees increase, we go into the next season with a negative balance at times. We, our registration money covers our cost, not at all. It's all about fundraising for us. That's the only way we are able to operate fully is we go into our communities and we fundraise. And with COVID, it's hard because everybody's hurting. The businesses are hurting. They can't give as much as they used to, even though they want to. So to hear that in this time, when everybody's struggling, that we're talking about raising and increasing the rates, that less kids are gonna be able to play, 
is mind boggling to me. And that's every sport, that's not just ours. I've listened to everybody else here speak tonight and I think they all feel the same way. We're not out there making any money. We don't charge the Panthers, we don't charge a fee to get in. We don't charge a fee to park. We don't charge, we do have concessions, it's minimal. Our concessions that we earn on Saturday does not cover our $1,100 ref fees that we pay every Saturday. If we did not have donations, our registrations would never cover our cost. We have so many children that play on sponsorships, that apply for Dick Sports scholarships, and that amount that they get is not going to change. So if we increase what has to be paid out, then we, we've got to come up with it somewhere else and we can't get it from the families. They don't have it. They don't have it. Um, the qualifications to receive in every sports scholarship is any child that is on SNAP, Medicaid, or um, WIC. That is a large percentage. Look at our elementary schools. Look how many of them have a high percentage of free and reduced lunch. If your child gets free and reduced lunch, you qualify for a scholarship. So the majority of the kids that are out here on this field, they don't have the money to pay extra. They just don't. So we just ask that you consider the nonprofit organizations that are out there for the youth and the community trying to keep them outside, out of the bedroom, off the video games, and having a good time learning from each other and participating in a team sport that teaches them so much. We just don't want to take that away from them. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Gregory Holder, then Victor Rivera, then Dean Wallace, then Joe Sullivan. Gregory Holder, please. Madam Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, City Manager, City Attorney, Commissioners. I'm here tonight, again, I was here last night um, to speak about the Okinawan Martial Arts Program. And I'm here representing my grandson because once again, it's way past his bedtime and he can't be here to speak for himself. So I'll speak on his behalf. Um, my grandson, he's been a part of the Martial Arts Program since November 2020. And this is um, coming out of the, the pandemic where we had to school him at home. He was stuck in the house all day long and, and um, was, you know, kind of getting a little miserable as far as it went. In this program, what, what has happened is he had gained a lot more self-confidence, a lot more sense of responsibility, and grown physically and spiritually in this program. And from what I've been, I've been hearing, you know, with fees increasing and whatnot, if we have students who can no longer attend this program, then the program probably will go away. And um, he asked me to come back here tonight because he couldn't be here. And he said, he, he said, he calls me Pappy. He says, Pappy, go back and speak to the commission and ask him please to allow this program to continue to go on. And I know several of the other students who attend the same program feel the same way. They're excited about it. And Mr. Mike Abrams, he is a fantastic teacher. And not only does he teach the martial arts skills, but he teaches the kids discipline. He teaches them safety. And he makes sure that everyone stays safe in their environment. And he keeps the program and keeps the facility he keeps it up, and I've seen facilities out there, and Mr. Mike, as he pointed out, he keeps the facility pristine shape. So I recommend and I ask you please to reconsider the fee upgrades and whatnot that would cause him to lose some of the students. And we, we actually want to grow the program and not shrink it. And so I, I'm not gonna take any more of your time, you've been here a long time, but I, I ask you please to reconsider and to allow him to continue the program which he has done fantastically for so long. So bless you and thank you for listening to me. Appreciate it. Thank you, you sir. Victor Rivera, please.
Hello, everyone. My name is Victor Rivera. I'm a retired United States Army soldier in operations OIF and, I'm sorry, Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. I am retired because of injuries I sustained in combat. Sounds great. Catch 22. When they got me out in 2005, I had nowhere to go. Hell, to be honest with you, and a lot of my friends are here, they don't even know, I, on more than one occasion, put a gun in my mouth. I had nothing. Thankfully, in 1992, I became friends with Michael Abrams. Me and him studied together. And I found out through a bunch of BS martial arts schools that were more interested in collecting money than actually teaching anyone anything, um, that he had a school open. Because I endeavored to see where I was as a martial artist. I went to a local tournament. It was a Deltona High School. And I ran into him. And he said, Victor, I'm still teaching. I said, good, I'm on my way. I didn't participate, I watched. And I'll never forget the feeling of looking at that dojo and going, I'm back home where I started. I never stopped martial arts. I currently hold four different black belts in four martial arts styles, including a fifth degree black belt in this one, where I'm at right now. Mike asked me, what are you doing? I said, nothing. I literally had a VA doctor tell me, we're giving you a check every month so you can stay away from people. He asked me what I'm doing. I said, nothing. He goes, why? He helped calm my rage and everything else in my life. I went back, got an associate's degree at Daytona State, graduating with honors. I went to Rollins College, graduated second in my class. Then I went for my master's, graduated first in my class wasn't because I was gifted. I have four learning disabilities. He helped me get through all that. He didn't even know it. Currently, I'm a professor at several colleges in several places, and I'm a professional violinist. I play with everyone, including Disney, OPO, OSO. I'm a current con constant member of the Ocala Symphony Orchestra. I also have a youth program that I help run called the Flagler Youth Orchestra, where we have over 400 students, and we teach them for free. I have to drive an hour to get up there and an hour back. You want to know why? Kids don't have to pay anything and they get, to get, they get the top tier education that I got for almost nothing. And it breaks my heart to hear him look at me and say they're talking about shutting down my school or they're talking about making me an employee of the city, which by the way, an employee can be replaced. I don't know any of you. Although I grew up in this town, been here since 1981. I went to Enter Enterprise Elementary because it was the only school to go to. I went to Deltona Middle. I went to Deltona High. I was grateful. But I wasn't grateful when I found out that what made me who I am and gave me the opportunities to be who I am is being shut down. And it's not that he's costing you anything. He's giving you financial benefit. And if you need more, Fine, negotiate something, but don't shut down. I'm one of hundreds and hundreds of people that have benefited from this program. I'm a contributing member of this society. I'm also a business owner, too. Please, I'm begging you. With your higher graces, renew Sensei Abrams and let him do what he does best. Also, you... Thank you, sir. Dean Wallace, please. Thank you, sir. Dean Wallace. Good evening, I'm Dean Wallace. I've been out here since 98. Uh, Sensei Mike Abrams was also like a father to me growing up. I started in his program about 97. I am now a current first responder here in this county. And I know we all took the same pledge as well as my veterans here. We all took an oath to the Constitution, Florida, and to the United States. Additionally, those core values of commitment, integrity, and honesty, which are posted on your walls, you know what's right, you know what's wrong. Sensei's been here for a very, very long time, longer than most of you have been in, in this city. So that being said, I think we should continue and do what's right through honesty and integrity and allow Sensei to commit, continue what he's doing. That's all I have to say. I don't want to yell at you. It's not worth my time. Thank you, sir.
Joe Sullivan, then Lisa Childs Miller, then Elbert Bryant. Joe Sullivan, please. Madam Mayor, Commissioners, thank you for your service. You got a tough job. Thanks for the opportunity to be able to talk to you about the Boys and Girls Club. Last night, uh, you guys surprised me, so I'm going to give you the speech I was going to give you last night. Um, we were founded here in 1992, and uh, we now operate eight clubs. We serve kids five days a week, 48 weeks a year. Last year at the Harris Saxon Club, we had 176 kids, 59 every day. 95% of these kids were free or reduced lunch. 60% were, were from single parent homes. We charge $25 a year. If they can't pay that, they get scholarshiped. So again, last year we operated 1,186 hours. Kids spent 72,000 hours at the club. It cost us $211,000 to run this club with five staff and insurance and paying the schools. Um, some of this money came from government. We apply for grants, but we raised more than half of it, most of it, well, really all of it outside of this community. So um, uh, what we've been doing there, um, the, the big reason I wanted to come in and talk to you, we've lost our middle school kids. They get out of school at five o'clock. We've been asking to stay until seven. All of our clubs are open till seven or eight, except Deltona. We've lost our middle school kids here. So we really appreciate the use of the building, but we hope that we can extend our hours there because we have to do a good job every day with the kids we serve uh, and, and generate revenue at the same time. Um, we're different. Again, we're open every day, 48 weeks a year, 10 hours a day in the summer. Uh, we provide breakfast, we provide lunch, and less than 1% of our money comes from fees. So we really need your help to continue the club. And again, um, uh, CDBG, built that facility with federal dollars. It's supposed to be a community resource, not something for the local city to make money on. So all of our other cities give us a free place because we're a great resource. We're a great public-private partnership. So I need your help going forward. And um, really, uh, uh, all I can say is please help us out. I've heard a lot of impassioned pleas here. Everybody wants to make a difference. With I think you got a lot of big good-hearted people here. You just need to make the right decisions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Lisa Childs Miller. Good evening. Uh, I don't represent any of the organizations that are here tonight. Um, I don't run a league in Deltona, um, but I'm a mom and I've been a resident since 1984. Uh, my kids have played sports in some of these leagues and still currently play sports in some of these leagues. I've pressure washed Dewey Oboster myself as a donation to the league because we knew damn well the city wasn't going to do it. And that's sad. As a resident that pays taxes, knowing that the city is not going to maintain the park that my kids pay to play at. I also think that I have a unique perspective because I have run a league. I've also overseen a governing body that was a worldwide international nonprofit. I think the comments that your city manager has made about the registration are ignorant. Um, you are completely ignoring the governing bodies of some of these organizations that are not going to allow that type of registration, period. Um, I think you guys are talking about subjects that are outside of your depth and that you need to do more research before you make a decision on this. And that's my professional opinion as someone who's run these leagues at a higher level than you guys are even considering. Um, as far as the funding agreement, as a parent, I pay taxes here for these parks that you are not maintaining. They're not supposed to be revenue generators for you guys when you don't even maintain the parks. That's what my taxes are for. As a resident, I'm perfectly happy to pay a small amount more in taxes to maintain the parks if that means that more of these low-income children are able to play. Most of the schools in Deltona are Title I schools. That means that those students are living below the poverty line. They can't even afford lunch, and you guys are asking them to pay more fees to play youth sports. That's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous that a governing body that is supposed to be for the community 
that is funded by the community is even talking about how to generate revenue after, uh, from children in the community. I only saw one organization on this list that was for adults. And even in that case, why are we, why are we trying to charge our residents who already pay taxes? You guys are not being fiscally responsible with our money. I'm listening to this great plan that I'm sure that we paid a, a pretty penny for, where they're literally telling you that they're going to show you how to make more money to pay for Parks and Rec, while you are sitting here discussing how to financially destroy the youth organizations in this town. This should be tabled until you have more information, or at least until this comes out. This is not something that should be decided in haste. I think renewing that the city contracts as they stand for these organizations is the smart thing to do. It's also the, the ethical thing to do. This is not the time for the city to start making revenue off its poorest citizens and the ones that need these services the most. I am really disappointed to hear our city manager talk about taking over the registration processes of these youth sports organizations. Like, it's something for you guys to control. I also don't see that all the residents are gonna be okay with giving all their private information to the city. You guys already have proven, you, ha you don't even know where your stuff is, and you want me to give you my personal information? I don't think so. Get your house in order, and then I'll consider it. But as of right now, I wouldn't give you my dog's name, let alone my child's information. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Elder Bryant. That's your budget book. It's amazing how thick that budget book is. Amazing. Oh, let's see here. Parks and Recs, $5 million budget. And that doesn't even include the other side of this book with Parks and Recs. Oh, that's right. $3.125 million in capital improvements for the Parks and Recs. You know, I hear all these nice, compassionate pleas tonight, but you know, I have a problem too. When I go to a park and some league wants to charge me to go into my own park because they have a contract supposedly that says when they're on the fields, I can't use the fields. There's a problem with that. There really is. When I go to a building to play basketball, oh, I can't play because somebody has a contract to where I can't play that night. I know. This sounds kind of funny because all these people are talking about kids. But I've been here 30 years. My kids went through programs. That, oh, that's right. Deltona didn't have back then. This is your budget book. $76,000 you brought in last year, that's pennies compared to $8 million that you're spending on parks and recs. Oh, now let's, let's think about this. We're asking for a small fee to help offset taking care of our parks. But in some cases, when we have these use contracts, they're telling residents that they can't go in unless we pay them to go into our own parks. I find that kind of interesting. That should never happen. Because like them, I pay taxes. I expect to use my damn parks if I wanted to. I expect to be able to go down to Dewey Booster if I want to walk the whole out round and be able to walk it. I, don't, I shouldn't have to pay a $7 fee to go into that park because somebody is using it. That is an organization. I don't care if it's nonprofit or not. I don't care if they're helping the kids or not. When they want to charge me, a resident, to go into my park, I have a problem with that. I really do. Now, the gentleman that runs Okinawa, I can honestly tell you, he's been doing a marvelous job over the years. And I applaud his attitude. 
But you know something? I can look out in this audience tonight and I can count on my hand how many of these people I've seen here every Monday night. Or during budget season when this counts. Hell, I can do like this and me, me, I've been here during the budget season. And there's only one of you up there that's been more to this place and been in these meetings more than I have, and that's you, Heidi. So I'm going to tell you now, it's funny that I hear all this whining about fees, and yet a lot of times I can't even go into my park and use my parks that I've paid taxes for for 30 years. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mayor, that closes public comments. <laughs> Commissioner Bradford. I was raised, I grew up on the ballpark. So I, I totally get when you guys are talking about how activities and sports, they do wonders. Because if we weren't playing softball, we were playing basketball. If it wasn't basketball, we were doing gymnastics. That's what kept me out of trouble. That's what kept me busy. If it would have cost, and I, and I have to agree, if it would have cost my parents back then $5 a game to take myself, my sister who played, and my parents to show up, I never would have been able to be active in those sports. And I can't say that I could be here today because who knows what I would have gotten into. And I'm, I'm kind of following the same that our vice mayor brought up is, why do we waive this, 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 and this, but I'm charging this, this, and this, and this to certain groups? Where do we get that criteria from? How do I say this group is more important than this group if this group is saving just as many lives as this group? I can't say, I think the Boys and Girls Club has done an amazing job, they really have. I can say the Altona Little League has done an amazing job. I can say the Panthers have done a great job. I can say our soccer's done a great job. But what I can say is who we're gonna waive, and I'm, I'm still not understanding, I, I'm gotta be in agreement. $5 does not sound like a lot of money, but I'll give you a recent story. I have a, this is gonna date me, so you guys don't hold it for granted. I have a couple grandkids, we won't say their ages because I'm waiting for polls. I got one in T-ball. I had to help pay for shoes, pants, a ball mat, a ball bat, because mom paid the registration fee and the parents want to get their kids in sports, but the problem they have is, okay, great, I signed them up, and then you get a call the next day going, um, I just read the paper, and I gotta buy all this stuff, and where does this money come from, Mom? Well, of course, crap, my grandpa's gonna help you, right? But that's not always the case. But these activities are what's keeping our kids out of trouble, and I really think we wanna revisit this because they're already paying one registration fee, and it does mean a lot for a child to be able to look up and see mom and dad and grandpa and grandma and all these people in the bleachers. And when you're talking $5 a head, that may not happen. So I know we're sitting here talking about an 80-20 split, but to me, I'm looking at, and Ryan, don't kill me on this, you know, but I'm looking at $250,000 a year we make, let's just say a Dewey. That's a drop in a bucket for what we could do for a few children's, children's lives. You know, can we, can we switch some funds around and find a way to use grant money to assist and do some scholarships for children? I mean, there's gotta be something we can do. You know, I, I, you, I'll touch my heart because you brought me back to that childhood and what, what brought me here today. And what brought me here today was 30 years being active in sports and keeping me out of trouble. So I, I just want us to really think about that. I mean, Deltona Little League, to me, I mean, all of these, I just went through them again and I'm checking off, you know, to me, every one of them is an asset to some part of our city. You just said more than most of them make. Mr. Graham, 
So I, I, I don't know, that's just my personal opinion. I think we really need to reevaluate and, and they're right. I, I would not have been able to play. My parents wouldn't have been able to play. My sisters wouldn't have been able to come watch. Nothing at five twenty dollars a head. Oh no. So I, I really think we need to reevaluate this. Um, five dollars a person, twenty percent of revenue. And I don't know if I'm the only one that feels this way, but I, I feel that I really need to voice this opinion um, because. Our children need this, and our children need it more now than they did before. So I don't know what direction we're gonna give the city manager because he's gonna be working on drawing up a paper that says you're gonna be paying 80 to 20%. We're gonna be doing an 80-20. And that means we're gonna be raising rates for children, like they said, and that means we're gonna have less children doing activities and you know what that means? I'm gonna have more children on the streets getting in trouble. You know what that raises? That means I need more sheriffs on the street. So what's less money? Waving this or spending more money on the sheriff's office? Thank you, ma'am. Commissioner McCool. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And in a pragmatic view, and I wanna make something clear, when I'm talking about how are we going to pay for it, we need to pay for it, right? I am not monetize, I am not trying to monetize our children and our children's future. I am one of the biggest advocates on this dais for children and recreation and parks and recreation. So with that being said, I agree with Commissioner Bradford regarding what do we do here, because during budget season, during budget season, parks and recreation is one of my highest priorities. My voting record says that, and we do need to figure out how to take care of these kids. But we have to talk about the, we have to talk about, I'll let you finish, sir. We have to talk about how we pay for it. And we have, I'll, I'll wait until you're done, sir. It's already been paid for with tax money. Which is why I have asked, and I asked the city manager, the expenditure to income ratio so that we can understand we need to pay for the kids. I'm not understanding what's not being understood about me trying to say we need to pay for these kids, figure out how to pay for the kids here. The tax dollars, the tax dollars, and the budget that we have and the projects that we have to do to bring these parks up, we're not trying to kick the kids out and terminate programs. I'm not, that's not what I'm voting for. That's not what my voting record says. But we have to talk about how we do this, and that's what we're trying to talk about. That's what I want to talk about. I'm in agreement with Commissioner Bradford. Anita, <laughs> we have to still talk about how we do this, and that's all I'm asking for, is that we talk about how we do this. This has to be workshopped, and I understand that this needs to be done, right? But there needs to be a, a clear understanding. This is a first step and a clear understanding of how we do this, right? So that everybody is on the same page. That's what I, as a commissioner, am asking for. Madam Mayor, um, if I could just interject here. I have, um, uh, I can and am planning on getting the contract out uh, for Mr. Abrams tomorrow, and we'll contact him. I also talked to the gentleman from the Boys and Girls Club and asked the city manager if I could, I'm going to give him that extra hour, and I'll talk to Parks about it so that he can attract the middle school children that he has been unable to. So those are the two that I have right now that will move forward and that will hopefully take some pressure off so that you know y'all can have a workshop and 
you know, work with the city manager to determine how, how these contract terms will proceed. But I think if I can take care of those two tomorrow, um, then that is creating some stability um, with two groups. And that's the only two that, that I'm aware of. And I'll talk to the city manager if there's others he needs us to modify. But I'm committed to getting those done tomorrow and I will call both of those parties and have them ready. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So, um, <clears throat> like um, Commissioner Bradford, I too was, grow I grew up in the city, in New York City. We grew up in PAL. And we had community centers that we could walk into free of charge, help us with homework and stuff like that. Um, I've always been on the side of our youth. I ran a youth organization for 15 years here in Deltona. Um, so I know what it's like um, to do fundraising. I know what it's like to have funds to pay for buildings that we needed to rent. Thanks to uh, Nick Pizza, most of our time was in his building free of charge. But other than that, we had expenses. So I know, I know what, you know, uh, all these teams here have to go through to raise money. We wash cars. We sold candy, and we did a lot of things. So I listened to all of you, and my heart goes out to all of you, because like I said, I am also a youth leader. I took a lot of money from my pocket to make up the differences. Um, I agree with Commissioner Bradford. I think we should sit down and look this over again. Um, and come out with another solution and see how we can make this better um, for our residents. And, you know, I know this is not going to be well taken up here at the dais, but they are taxpayers. And I think we owe them something, especially the children. Um, I think we need to take care of their children. We need to be a village and raise their children. Thank you, Thank you ma'am. So I just have a couple of questions. First of all, the Boys and Girls Club, they want to, they are shut down now at five, they want to be open till seven. Do we charge them anything? No, they're, they're shut down at six? Okay. Till seven. So one extra hour. So the other question I have, Mr. Sullivan made a comment that he gets free uh, space everywhere else. It sounded like we charge him. Do we charge him for any space? No. So just I'm just using this as clarification. Yeah. I made notes as this went on. Mm -hmm. So the Boys and Girls Club does not pay for Saxon, Harris Saxon, at all. And then, then we will work on that extra hour. Second yes. of all, the Okinawan Martial Arts. Was there any discussion of shutting them down? No, not that because I'm aware of. Because this was brought up multiple times that it was no. shut down. Just no. no, no. It was not my understand. It was not my understanding that we were shutting down any of these organizations. That was not, that was not what I understood from Madam that. Mayor. It was also, also not my understanding that we were making them employees of the city. That was never presented to us in the paperwork. It, is, it, it was never presented to us prior to this meeting or to me, maybe somebody else, that we were shutting any of these organizations down. Was, were any of these organizations told that they will be shut down? Well, the, mar the martial arts was told they will not have their contract renewed. Were they told that? They would not have the, buy okay, that's okay. I'm just, I'm, I'm just asking. I understand your, your, your passion. It was never, never the intention from my standpoint that we were shutting any of these organizations down, especially your organization, nor the Boys and Girls Club or anything else. Um, just, just, in clear, just clarification for that. Yeah. Um, and I spoke to the gentleman from Boys and Girls Club, and I spoke to Mr. Abrams, and I asked if he could handle a 30-something-year-old child and 
help him focus and do some things because I'm very impressed with this program too. But I told them both that I will call them tomorrow and you know and proceed with their agreements. The other Madam, comment, Madam Mayor, uh, if, almost done. The other comment that the 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 lady made about um, taking in that the city taking in funding be, becoming the collector of the funds for all these organizations. She brings a good point that there are organizations that, that do not follow that process. You don't follow that process. So when we start becoming stewards of everyone else's money, it's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. That is not, I, I, I'm not, especially with some of the organizations that you work with in general, not everyone, but I just want to be clear on that, that that is something, these are all subjects of discussion. No vote has been taken on anything this evening except to do an inventory and sell some of our stuff. The other thing is a consensus to bring some things forward for another meeting for discussion. The last comment I want to make is Mr. Bryan with his parking fees and going into a park and being charged parking fees. Never, ever, and I've lived in this city since 1983, have I heard of someone going into a park and being charged parking fees, especially Dewey Boster, which was also partially built with ECHO funds. So to be charging parking fees or an entrance fee for a game or anything else and being stopped to go in there is unprecedented. And I hope, I hope that it never happens again and I hope whoever allowed that, whatever organization that was, whatever went on there, never happens again. The last thing I want to say in clarification, we, the city commission, have the, only the authority to direct a manager and an attorney. We don't have the authority to talk to any staff member and tell them, I don't like the color of the park benches today, I want them blue. I want you to charge $5 instead of $7. You need to be charging, you don't. We're, that is not in our scope, that is a charter violation for us to do all those things. So we rely on multiple things, to be, multiple entities to bring information to us, whether that's you, and you have obviously, sir, had a passionate group of people here supporting you. And that's admirable, and it stands for who you are and what you do. That you have had two nights in a row, a group of people supporting you and your organization that's been here multiple years. So I want to be clear from my standpoint, was never any intent to shut you down or shut your program down. The greater picture here is when you look at facility use agreements, and this question has been brought up by multiple commissioners, who gets something waived, who doesn't? Who gets a concession agreement, who doesn't? How do we determine these things when was the last time these agreements were brought before a city commission to vote on? And what kind of a process do we have? And those are all questions that need to be addressed, not by you, but by this commission, to understand and by management to find out where we are in the process. And unfortunately, we're going through that in multiple departments. Multiple, because again, we cannot go in and tell staff what to do. We can't go in and say, I want you to discipline that person for putting a box, or as you said, we'll put it over there and take care of it later. The, the, the commission can't do that. So as things become aware to us and we look at things, we have to address issues, including the parking fees and including facility use agreements. And a lot of times we have meetings like this and we learn a lot. We learn a lot from you and we learn a lot from you and you and everybody else that chose to come up here and speak and I thank you for that. So Mr. Peters, I apologize for going on. You wanted to say something and then Commissioner Sosa, you were on the board before we finish up. 
I'm good. You're good? I, I can tell you right now, I, I brought this up on the dais several months ago about going to parks and having, I believe it was the, the land dogs and the Tri-City Bulls I know blocking you did, the sir. entrance, not letting people in. We had to get VSO out of Dewey O Booster to direct traffic because they were tying up traffic all the way out to uh, Saxon Boulevard. It created a hassle. I was told it was taken care of. I went there and drove. I had to sit in line till I pulled over and started talking to the cop who was coming over. The next day, I go to Dwight Hawkins. They've got the gate. I go to pull in the gate. I'm told I can't park here because I'm not a coach. It's like, what are you talking about? This is a public park. I'm not saying I'm a commissioner. So I pull out. There's another parking spot. I go to pull in there. Guy tells me, you're not getting in here unless you pay $7. So there is a problem when we loan out our parks that folks want to charge residents to get into the parks. That day, I was extremely upset. Mr. Peters can vouch for that because he was on my speed dial that day. I was driving on Catalina when you called me. And let's just I know say I had some very on Catalina words when I got the call about how the park was being managed. And I was not happy. I'm sorry, sir. Yep. Weekend? Yes, one was on a Saturday and then on a Sunday. One was at Dewey O'Boster, the other was at Dwight Hawkins. Uh, so I better not go out during the week, right? <laughs> so, so this Ciao, is a Charlie. problem, and I believe this is where Mr. Peters wants to get rid of the folks charging fees. Once they pay the fee for the rental, he wants to get people to not charge fees blocking our entrances and not excluding public uh, residents from public parks. And right, so, so this should be an online structure. If this team wants to charge people to come watch our team, which they had a lot of people out there. I mean, there were, gosh, the, the a couple hours I was there, there was probably four teams came played, talking a couple hundred people per team, paying seven bucks. They were making a killing try, and then blocking up traffic. So he wants, Mr. Peters is looking at regulating that, which I am not a big fan of regulation, but this, when you're charging people to get into a pub, public park, you're backing up roads. This is a process when they're running out fields and they want to charge admission. It needs to be done online. We need exactly. to be able to get into the parks and residents who are not there for the game shouldn't be paying. I, I agree with you 100%. So I, I can totally agree with that part 100%. So, and again, I have never heard of that and seen that in years past. This is the first time but I mean, this is recently, with this situation, is the first time this has happened. And this is another reason that we have to have these discussions as a commission, because Commissioner Sosa is aware of it, residents are aware of it, we need to be made aware and we need to correct it, because it's not fair to anybody to have one organization, wherever they're from, come in here and tie up a park and tell people they can't come in because they've been, they have to pay for parking. And again, and, and we're paying, we're, they're paying us a field use fee, but what are they collecting from everybody that's not even there to see their event and feels like they have to pay or turns around and leave? So these are issues, Mr. Peters, that I hope, I hope that we have some accountability, that nice word, for how this happens, who allows this. And I'm sorry, sir, the ball from this commission stops with you stops on your desk because that's all we have is to direct you, correct Commissioner Sosa, to deal with these things and hold things accountable. Commissioner Bradford. So I just wanna, I just wanna clarify something, Mr. Sosa. I'm not talking waiving fees for, that's, that's a Deland, that's another group coming into our city. I'm talking about waiving fees for our Deltona Little League, Deltona Panthers, Deltona Youth Soccer Club, to, and, and excuse me if I don't go through um, this. Actually, actually, I'm not talking you know, about you, waiving fees at all. I'm uh, saying they are charging residents right. additional money just to go into right. the park. And I understand it's that. It's a fee to enter or your own public park that your tax is paid for. I get that. I'm not talking I, about I don't fees. agree with that either, but so. what I was talking about was 
if, if I'm talking, we're waiving fees and, and charging admission and all this, that's to our local organizations that are doing something to benefit the residents and communities of Deltona. And we got a group coming in here from I don't care where, and they're running a field. And honestly, yeah, they shouldn't be able to charge. That, that should be something that our Parks and Rec is in charge of. I have no problem with that. I'm just saying organizations and groups that are benefiting our community should not be being charged whatever these fees are. But those groups coming in, that's, that's for them guys to do the agreement on. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying, hey, we're going to do a blanket not charging. I just want to clarify that. But I agree. Hey, nobody kick me out of my park. And the last thing, um, commissioners, um, Marsha has stated that she's going to discuss with the two entities and bring a contract forward. Will that contract be coming to the city commission for approval? Um, one of the contracts is just awaiting signatures. These have been routinely, when they're renewals and things, they don't come in front of you in Okay, the but now you're changing at the Boys and Girls Club and you're adding an extra hour. That's a change to the contract. Does that not come to the city commission? I'm asking because people in the audience are saying you commission should be held accountable for that. Um, the one with... So let's, sorry, let's be clear here. Are they coming to us or not? Because once again, Madam Mayor, yes, any contract revision that involves a waiver will come to the commission. That's what I said earlier tonight. If we will not make any decision regarding waivers without a clear policy from commission or commission voting on an individual basis, what I am hopeful for is to have a fee structure the staff can work off of. If someone believes they are providing a community benefit, then hopefully the policy that you all approve for waiver of fees will be specific enough that it will be easy to understand. If not, we will bring every one of them to the commission for approval. Thank you, sir. Just want to be clear on that because there were questions, how did these things get approved? And and so I need clarification. On the Boys and Girls Club, they have an existing contract that doesn't expire. And so in normal, in the old days, or whatever you want to say, I'm just changing an hour in the contract. But the contract so, here, it says a term to line 17, 2022. And then you have contract expires 9, 18, 20, 23. So there is an expiration date on that, but I, the term is- But not is, right now. Okay. Yeah, so I would just make the change and, you know, basically I normally in that case, the city manager signs, I sign, and it's done. If when it comes up for renewal or, wh or whatever the renewal terms are, that would be a different story. With regards to um, Mr. Abrams, um, that one is just awaiting the city manager's signature and my signature, no change. So no, typically that would not then be placed in front of you. Well, right, but the, but again, this is, Please just send out a clarification email. Madam Mayor, yes. um, as far as I'm concerned, the Boys and Girls Club contract would need to come back to the commission because it is a change in the terms of the current contract by adding an hour. Mm -hmm. If they want to maintain the current hour, we can proceed with that. But if they want to change the hour, that modified contract would need to come to the commission for approval, absent a policy in place regarding waivers. Um, with regard to the um, Okinawa, um, you know, right now they're $120 a month, as I said earlier tonight. We will put language in there that if the city commission uh, at a later date changes the fee structure, that new fee structure would be part of their contract. Yeah. One, that one will have to come to you also you. then. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Everything. We we're done with public comment. We can talk afterwards, Charlie, because we got to follow the protocol, okay? Thank you. Thank you. We are adjourned.